Good evening. The July 25th, 2022 Board of Education uh, meeting is called to order. The Wichita Public Schools will be the district of choice in our region where all students and staff are empowered to dream, believe, and achieve. We are uh, happy to have you with us tonight. Uh, tonight we will have Julie Hedrick uh, with us by teleconference. Uh, by per uh, school board policy, she will have every uh, uh, right as a sitting member to vote and to participate in the meeting. Um, I'd like to call for a moment of silence. Thank you. Tonight's Pledge of Allegiance is uh, conducted by the Northeast Magnet JROTC cadets, uh, led by Commander Anna Bridgman, Brian Rorabaugh, uh, Sh Sh Shay Z. Jones, and Jaden Patton. And would you please rise for the ble Pledge of Le Allegiance? Post the colors. Thank you, sir. Terry. You may be seated. Let's give the uh, Northeast Magnet JRTC cadets a round of applause. Okay, Patrick, first item, please. First item, under reports, good news. Good evening, President Reeser, Dr. Thompson, members of the board. Um, I'm Lauren Hatfield, this is Michelle Kuda, and we are going to present all of our summer school coordinators this evening. Later this evening, we're gonna talk about summer school and give you a data update, and we didn't feel like it was appropriate to do that without recognizing the people that made this happen every single day um, in our buildings. It's a long list of names, caveat, a lot of them aren't here because they're at enrollment, which is a good thing. Uh, we want them to be there. Uh, but we're still going to read their name, even if they're not here, so you get an idea of the scope of how many, even just coordinators, it took to pull off our summer programs. And we'll start with elementary, so I'll turn it over to Ms. Kuda. Okay. 
Okay, I can't reiterate enough what Lauren, I can't reiterate enough what Lauren has said about how these are the people that really helped make this happen. So we're going to start with elementary. Our first person is Rachel Cole. She was a site coordinator at Allen Elementary. Rachel Lee, she was a site coordinator at Buckner Elementary. Tawana Glover, Cessna Elementary Site Coordinator. James Quillen, Cloud Elementary Site Coordinator. Taylor Garcia, College Hill Summer Site Coordinator. Michelle Wilkes, Dodge Elementary Site Coordinator. Jennifer Miller, Griffith Elementary Site Coordinator. Julie Wilkes, Harry Street Elementary Site Coordinator. Deosha North, uh, Isley Elementary Site Coordinator. Jill Pfeiffer, Jefferson Elementary Site Coordinator, Amy Stanislawski, Kinsler Elementary Site Coordinator, Daylin Osborne, Linwood Elementary Site Coordinator, Matt Phillips, McCollum Elementary Site Coordinator, Cindy Chrisman, Minaha Elementary Site Coordinator, Muriel Love, Mueller Elementary Site Coordinator, Marshall Moore, OK Elementary Site Coordinator, Nicole Markheim, Park Elementary Site Coordinator, Glenn Williams, Seltzer Elementary Site Coordinator, Amy Hart, Stanley Elementary Site Coordinator, and Bettina Banks. She was the Woodman Elementary Site Coordinator. So thank you, Elementary Site Coordinators. Right, you're gonna skip like the first five because they're all at enrollment. Okay. But we're going to still read their names. All right, now for, we're going to go to middle school on um, the seven middle school sites. So Shannon Greasel, CMA Summer School Coordinator. Angie Brown, Hamilton Summer School Coordinator. Sophia Welch, Pleasant Valley Middle School Summer School Coordinator. Lauren Coston, Robinson Summer School Coordinator. Trisha Lair, Stuckey Summer School Coordinator. Brian Harrod, Truesdale Summer School Coordinator. And Stephanie Uppendell is the Wilbur Summer School Coordinator. Most of them are current administrators and they are working hard at making sure people get enrolled. Now we're gonna switch to high school. Perfect, we're gonna recognize both the ELO, Extended Learning Opportunity, and regular summer school high school coordinators. Ryan Williams, East High ELO Coordinator. Tyson Yeager, East High ELO Coordinator. Michael Boykins, East High Summer School Coordinator. Tania Brown, Heights High School ELO Coordinator. Andrea Gruber, North High ELO Coordinator. Vanessa Martinez, North High Summer School Coordinator. Elizabeth Deckard, Northeast Magnet ELO Coordinator. Maria De Simone, Northeast Magnet ELO Summer School Coordinator. Darren Hammond, Northwest High School Summer ELO Coordinator. Jolene Maltz, South High ELO Coordinator. Caitlin Shonifer, Southeast High ELO Coordinator. Kathleen Harpenaw, West High ELO Coordinator. Tom Perkins, High School Summer School Coordinator Mentor. And Kelly Dunkelberger, High School Summer School Data and Enrollment Coordinator. Our next one are the special programs. So we'll start with Kayla Price, Extended Year Bryant Coordinator. John Pinka, Extended Year CLS Administrator. Katie Johnson, Extended Year Levy Administrator. Shonda Hayes, Extended Year Little Administrator. Dal Dombo, Native American Indian Education Program. Kim Bookhart, Scope Gifted um, Teaching Specialist. Megan, I should have worn my glasses. Megan Adams, Scope Coordinator. Jennifer Ramsey, SEAT, which is the Newcomer Summer School Coordinator. Daylin Jones, Summer Stealth Coordinator at Anderson. Tiffany Reeves, Summer Stealth Coordinator at Anderson. Christy Wise, Summer Stealth Coordinator at Adams. Sarah Puth, Summer Stealth Coordinator at Gordon Parks Academy. Devin Cosmo, Summer Stealth Coordinator at Spate. Hannah Evans Mendoza, Summer Stealth Coordinator at Washington. Marsha Greer, Summer Stealth Coordinator at White. Morgan Nance, Within Reach Administrator. 
Nikki Steely, Within Reach Coordinator, and Anna Marie Frisch, she is the Yes Summer Coordinator. So the So these are the awesome people that made summer school happen. Thank you so much for all your work and time that was put into this for kids. Thank you. Cheryl. I just want to echo thank you very much. Uh, our summer school program this summer was over and above what most school districts even have kids during the school year. So. It takes a lot of work to do that, and I know you all spent way more hours than we paid you for, mm -hmm. and thank you so very much for your hard work to make this a success. Well, it's got to get to go on vacation, right? <laughs> well, we hope they get to go on vacation at least for a day or two before school starts. <laughs> thank you. All right, Patrick, next item, please. Next item, under reports, Service Employees International. Welcome, Esau. Good evening, everyone. Dr. Thompson, President Reeser, board members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Uh, most of the phone calls I've been receiving are of people wanting to know when they start and come back to school, and, and they're relatively excited. Um, and uh, excited to get back in and start working with the kids. Uh, obviously, summer school was a great endeavor this summer, and all the staff did a terrific job. I've talked to the custodians. A couple of them are saying they're a little bit behind, but they're going to put in the extra effort to get everything caught up where they need to. The biggest concern I've probably had addressed at this point in time is um, COVID's coming back around. A lot of people have been quarantined lately here at the last part of their summer. And employees are just a little bit concerned that as we get back together that we might have some extra additional sick days because of COVID that might be in addition to what we've had over past years. Um, hopefully that's not totally the case, but if it is, we hope that you'll be kind to employees that do catch uh, corona this year and, and have to miss extra days than usual. Um, and I've had some people ask when all the hand sanitizer and stuff's coming back out. So um, if you guys have any answers for any of those questions, we'd love to hear it. Otherwise, we're ready to get right back at it. Thank you, Saint. Thank you, Esau. Thanks, guys. Patrick, next item, please. Next item, under reports, United Teachers of Wichita. We welcome Katie Warren. Hi, I'm Katie Warren, and this is my 17th year in Wichita Public Schools. Um, I'm the Vice President of United Teachers of Wichita. I hope you can bear with me because I'm not as quite of an eloquent speaker as Brent, <laughs> so not used to being up here. Um, I just wanted to start by introducing Teresa Osborne. She is from North, and she's our new UTW organizer. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I come to you with 20 years of classroom experience and approximately another 12 or so years of federal, state, and local nonprofit and governmental education focused work. And I just look forward to a relationship that I believe is going to benefit our children as we work to see their success proliferate. Thank you. Well, I just wanted to start off by saying I cannot ever recall in the last 17 years walk, walking into that report week with a contract in place, so thank you for a fair contract for our staff. Um, unfortunately, we've had rising number of COVID cases in Sedgwick County, so I want to thank you for reviewing those safety protocols for students and staff. We all want our students and staff in school and healthy. Um, I'd also like to ask, kind of like what Esau said, if you could review your attendance, attendance policies for this year for our students and staff. We don't want people coming to school if they're feeling ill or worrying if they need to take off to care for ill family members. 
Um, I wanted to take a moment to thank each of you for all you do for our students and staff in Wichita. Being on the school board the past few years has had to have been incredibly difficult, and we see the time you dedicate to the community, and we appreciate your service on the board. Um, I know it's hard to believe, especially with this heat, but summer break is coming to an end, and in a few short weeks, we'll be back with students at school. Um, as a parent of a Wichita Public student, he's a sophomore at Northwest, and hopefully he's not watching this because he'd be super embarrassed <laughs> <laughs> that I brought him up. But I just really want to take a moment to thank all the teachers, nurses, counselors, speech paths, custodians, administrative assistants, principals, peer consultants, and all staff who work hard every day to make this a great place for students to learn and grow. My son has had an excellent education. He's been in Wichita Public School since pre-K, and I can't imagine him going anywhere else. Like, it's been amazing. Um, we hope everyone has a wonderful start to their school year, and that's all I have. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, Dr. Thompson, um, is there uh, any plans to get the attendance policy or review the attendance and COVID protocol for students and staff uh, before the school year starts? We will be um, bringing information to you um, at the next board meeting, August the 8th, I believe so, yes. And uh, Esau brought up the hand sanitizers, or, uh, we have a plan on that as well? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much, and I appreciate you, both unions, bringing that, uh, those issues up to our attention. Uh, Patrick, next item, please. Next item, public communications. Seeing none, we'll move on to the education portion of our agenda. Uh, Patrick? Next item, under education, outcomes of summer 2022 learning opportunities. And I'll let Dr. Thompson introduce the topic. because I always steal everyone's thunder. Mr. Alvarez has arrived at the mic, so I will turn it over to Mr. Alvarez and my wonderful team here. You good? You feeling all right over there? Oh, great. <laughs> Listen, Amanda's here in case my water breaks. That's why she's here, because this is it. I'm going on maternity leave as soon as I'm done with this presentation. You think I'm kidding, but I'm not. I'm walking out. That's it. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Thompson. Uh, President Reeser, members of the board, just wanted to introduce, you just saw a whole bunch of site coordinators in here get celebrated and recognized. Uh, I do want to recognize our two that will be presenting, Lauren Hatfield, Executive Director in the Secondary Office, and Michelle Kuda, Executive Director in Elementary Office. I want to say thank you to them because they were actually uh, pivotal to the success of our summer programming. Uh, we also want to thank our teachers uh, for doing such a wonderful job in our Paris, such a wonderful job during summer school and our site coordinators. But we couldn't have done it without the planning team. We started in October of first semester just to start talking about what is the robust summer programming going to look like in order to engage our students uh, to mitigate learning loss and to, to prevent the summer slide that some students could get. So uh, it was a robust and a phenomenal summer school program, the biggest that we've ever had even compared to last year. And so I don't want to steal their thunder either, because I know they've got some of those to share with you. Uh, but I just would be remiss if I didn't thank Dee Dee Stroot for facilitating all the planning sessions starting in October, and then these two ladies, as well as Shannon Benoit and all the other. You, you saw the different types of summer programming we offered. Each one of them had a person that was coordinating that as well. So I'll turn it over to Lauren and Michelle. Good evening again, everyone. Um, we are excited to bring you um, some of the data from summer school, also knowing that it's not fully complete data yet either, because we actually have some summer programs that are still happening. And so there, there are some students being served in our summer programs that wouldn't even be a part of this data because they're still being served in those programs. Um, just a quick reminder that we had a conversation, I don't know, March, April with all of you about what our goals for the summer programs were. And they were centered around our strategic plan. And so every single one of our summer programs that we're gonna talk about focuses on one or more of the goals that's in the strategic plan. Every single summer program, regardless of elementary, secondary, special programs, doesn't matter, had schools as trusted and safe places as one of their primary goals for summer schools and ways to increase the connection between our students 
and our staff and our students in the community, uh, and our schools in the community. And then depending on the program, they attached one of the other strategic plan goals to it. And as Gil mentioned, part of our goal is to mitigate the summer slide. There's natural regression in, in June and July. And so how do we mitigate some of that slide so that you don't slide as far, or maybe you don't even slide at all. Uh, and what I'm excited about in our data is not only did some kids not slide backwards in June, but they actually grew in terms of their comprehension and analysis in June. So we're gonna start with elementary because you're gonna have to hear my voice for a long time with secondary programs. And so we wanted to start with elementary and Michelle Kuda. Okay, um, the first slide that you're gonna see here is our partners. And I just want to say thank you to all of our community partners, because without them, we wouldn't have been able to build that exciting, that enjoyable experience, and even a robust experience. So you can see all of them on there, um, all of them contributing to the success of the program. And if you go on to our next slide, this is, about, this is our participation data. So when you look at it, we had, of our eligible students, we had 16,676 students. And of those students, we had 2,675 enrolled. Then, um, percent, so that, if you put that into a percentage, 16% of our eligible students enrolled in summer school. And then we had 2,184 attend. So percent of students enrolled who attended, we hit 81%. And if you look over on the right of the graph, you'll see it broken down um, by numbers, by grade level. And I, it's positive and it's encouraging to see that our first and second grade were the highest because those are really the students that we're wanting to target to get that reading foundation to hit that strategic goal of the third grade. So then our next one, this is uh, definitely a celebration. We knew that we're looking at the strategic plan, making our schools a safe and trusted place. We put in the, we put in the SEL, the literature circle, to start our day off with. We knew that we had kids going to different schools. We had kids that would be with teachers that they were not familiar with, and they'd be in classrooms with kids that they weren't familiar with. So how do we start our day and make it a place where kids feel belonging and they feel trust. So we put these literature circles in and as you can see in the data from the feedback, it was a success, definitely an overwhelming positive response and something we'll want to continue. Um, I, wanted, I was just gonna put like one positive comment to the side or one second from the survey that we um, gave to the teachers, and I ended up with four. But basically, I couldn't narrow it down because it really, I think that second, it brought a sense of belonging and a warm atmosphere to start the day, and that was our goal. That's what we wanted. So um, then, our next graph, our academic pieces that we were looking at was the word recognition, the decoding. That was our big focus. We had the comprehension in writing, and we had the math. What we did with, what we asked the teachers in their survey was, did you feel prepared with the content and were you confident with the instruction and the content that was put available for you? Um, you can see that, uh, that we had a pretty good result, that they felt that they were prepared and they felt confident. What was interesting from this data when you're looking at the bars, because we have the middle one being the comprehension and the writing, the decoding, the word rec, is a natural practice for them. It's something that we do during the school year. And the math fluency practice, also, the comprehension and writing was a new strategy that um, Learning Services trained the teachers for. It was the literature-based piece that we were working toward. We had an overwhelmingly positive response for that. So, and they felt prepared and confident, and a lot of comments, we're gonna take this good teaching back to the regular school year. So our next graph is gonna show you some results. And so starting out, we know that our narrow focus is that reading and is that word recognition time. So we took the word recognition standard for each grade level and that's the one that we assessed on. In your packets, you have what that standard is for each grade level in a document that looks like this. 
And then over to the right, it lists what the curriculum was and the instruction was that we used with it. So that you can see that the curriculum and instruction that we put in place for the standard was directly aligned to the results that, and the instruction that the students received. What you're going to see in that first bar, that is the pretest. So that would have been the score that the students received at the end of the school year for their grade because we're using the scales. And then you look at the lighter bar, the turquoise bar, and that is our ending one. The teachers kept scores, they kept a score every week on the word recognition as part of the data. Um, and what you're gonna see is every grade level made some progress and we were able to make some growth. Another celebration is that first grade showed the greatest progress and that is one of our targeted grade levels we know we have to hit to hit that strategic goal. Okay, so then we look at the afternoon. So this was new. Last year we went half days and then this year we extended it into the afternoon and we brought in five different activities. So when we surveyed the teachers, we wanted to get a result with, um, did you feel like this, this activity enhanced the summer program? And you're going to see that we have some various, a little bit of variation in the results. It was a high yes for the reading under the stars, and that was simply doing self-selected reading time when the kids got to turn the lights out and use their flashlights. They loved that, I, I mean, it was so simple. The second one was the guest readers. This was a big hit. We were able to bring in a lot of community members to read, um, and you'll see right there on that front picture, we have a police officer reading to the students. The comments that were made were things such as, um, it was nice to have adults in the community share their love for reading with kids and their passion for, for books. And so then the other three, so that's all in the agree. When you look at the part where we're hitting the disagree, we have the virtual field trips, we have the author visits, and we have arts partners. We did get a lot of positive feedback on those, but the biggest comment was they don't want the virtual. They want people in front. For example, arts partners had artists in the rooms, but then also it was being filmed to other locations. And the ones that had the artists in the rooms were like, yes, this is awesome. But the virtual part wasn't as effective. We didn't keep the attention of the kids that we wanted to. So it gives us definite feedback as we plan for next school year. I do want to point out the quote I added to the bottom. Um, this, it says, overall summer camp was a much needed, uplifting experience for students and staff. And I do have to say that when you walked into a building, you did feel that positive energy from the teachers and the staff. Our next slide comes from feedback from the families. So we gave a feedback to the parents. And the first one was, was information easily accessible? And as you can see, um, we still have 15% of the families that felt like they needed more access to information. Feedback that we will take back and want to improve upon. Our next one, um, teachers were prepared and made classes fun. This, I feel like, is very positive feedback because, like I said, there was positive energy and we, you felt it in the buildings and obviously the parents felt it too. Our next question for the parents was um, the length of the program. And this was the same as last year. We went with the 16 days, four weeks. Um, a lot of the feedback that you're seeing on the 21% that says it's too short. And they wanted to extend it. A couple more weeks, they said. <laughs> so, um, the next one is the length of day. And this was positive to see, because I don't know if you remember when we came into the spring, we were a little bit concerned about extending from half a day to a full day, wondering, will staff want to do this? Will parents want to send their kids? And you'll see that only 7% said it was too long um, in the feedback from staff. And I, it was a question just asking, if we were to keep it as long as we did this time, would you teach again? And it was in the 90s that said yes. We will, we will come back and teach. So that is our elementary. 
CUDA did a lot of the hard work because um, the middle school questions and the survey data were pretty, pretty similar. So um, I'll go into middle school now, so summer camp WPS for grades six through eight. Um, you see the variety of community partners there. Um, what they helped us pull off is pretty amazing. We had seven sites and they were going to four different locations throughout the city every Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, and so, you know, this group would go to the YMCA while this group over here would go to the Exploration Place, while this group over here would go to WSU Tech, and this group over here um, would go to the Sedgwick County Zoo, and they would rotate through. So all the sites got to go to and participate with all of the places. Um, and so we just, we wouldn't have been able to pull off as robust of a program um, without all of these community partners. And a little later on, I'll talk to you about the ones that people really were like, please, please let us go to them again next year because they were, they were so amazing. So. Um, for grade six through eight, we had just over 4,600 students that were eligible um, with 687 of them enrolling, which is only 14.7%. We definitely would like that number to go up. I think one thing to consider for eighth graders though is eighth graders can also take high school summer school. And so we lose a chunk of our qualified eighth graders every year because they go take PE in the summer to prepare for high school. And so that eighth grade enrollment number um, is always going to be lower than sixth and seventh grade. Um, so then 537 of the 687 were still in attendance on the last day of summer school. Um, so of the kids that enrolled, almost 80% of them stayed the entire time, which, which is excellent. Um, and then there you see, just like elementary had, the, great, the breakdown by grade level. And again, not a surprise that eighth grade is so much lower than sixth and seventh because they have some additional opportunities that the sixth and seventh graders just don't have. <coughs> So our academic data, um, we had the SEL time in the morning, which was focused on a different strategy or word each day. So, you know, one day's word might be grit. What is grit? What does it mean to show grit? Um, how do you have grit? Another day's word might be cooperation. Uh, and so that dark blue is the SEL time. And then the quotes are from teachers. This is data from teachers. And so if you put, unlike elementary, we had strongly agree and agree options. Um, and so, but if you add them together, all of them are well over 80%, almost 90% positive responses for all three subject areas. The light blue is math. Um, and our math curriculum team put together math programs based on some tracked standards that we chose. Um, and one of the things that I saw over and over and over again in the quotes I selected was I tried to find quotes that there were some common themes, like, oh, I saw the same idea 12 times. Um, so was the use of rotations and stations and the ability to work with kids in small groups that it was more difficult than it would have been in the regular school year because the ratio of kid to adult in the room was so much lower because we had a teacher and a para in every single classroom. And then finally, ELA, which is the yellow bar, um, basically almost the exact same results as math. Um, and what they really liked was how the ELA and math teams connected what they did in the morning to the STEM kits that the kids would work on in the afternoon um, and how that all correlated together. Um, so special shout out to our teams that developed um, that curriculum because the teachers were very impressed with it and thought the students did a great job interacting with, the, with that material. Um, here's our academic data for, for middle school. Much like elementary, there's also a handout of what the track standards were for middle school. Um, in your packet, <clears throat> we chose each of these standards because one, they're tracked standards and they are highly tested in our state testing environment. Um, as well as their high leverage standards. So if you can do well on these standards, it's gonna help you in some of the other standards. That's how all of those standards were chosen. And they aligned, again, with the STEM kit work in the afternoon, particularly with math. Um, they made sure that the questions that they were asking 
were connected to the STEM kits in the afternoon. Uh, the scales are a little different though. So on the ELA side, it's the same as elementary. So the dark blue bar is the average score that those students had in the fourth quarter on that standard. And then the light blue bar is the average score that those students had according to the grade books that were kept by our summer school teachers. Math was a little bit different because we tested math in a pretest and a post test. So each week they would do a pretest before they would have any conversation over any of the standards and they would see if they could get the question right or wrong. And then on Thursday they'd take a post test and it wouldn't be the exact same question but it would be cover the same standard and see if they got it right or wrong. So the math one is percentages of kids who got the question right at the beginning of the week versus at the end of the week whereas English is fourth semester scale score versus end of summer school scale score. It's a little bit different there. <clears throat> the um, afternoon activity data, so um, again, like Kuda said, we expanded to the afternoon, so almost 90% of the teachers said yes, this enhanced the summer school experience for the students. Um, and in our question, we said, if we ran summer school again, which of the partnerships would you keep for sure? And there were a lot of them that got, every single one of them got a response. There wasn't any of them that scored a zero. But far and away, it wasn't even close. WSU Tech STEM Camp, the Sedgwick County Zoo, and the Greater Wichita YMCA were chosen by almost everyone in their response. Um, and I know Mr. Dixon is back there. We've already talked about some STEM camp options for next year and some other partners to tap into that are gonna be similar um, to WSU Tech STEM Camp because kids were doing amazing things. Like he, he was telling me um, there were middle school kids who had never flown a drone who were beating him in the drone race course uh, in the afternoon and they'd you know, never flown a drone before or um, they were learning how to practice painting a car with a virtual spray gun on a computer screen. Um, just pretty amazing stuff that they were doing. Um, and then there's a, a staff quote there, which again tries to capture um, the sentiment that was seen throughout the comments. And then also a student response um, about how it was fun and they went to new places and they learned about new jobs that they didn't know about before because that was really the focus of the afternoon was what's out there that you don't even know is out there. Um, and what career paths might there be that you've never even heard of before. And so every single partnership that we had tried to highlight that in their particular unique area. And then we asked parent guardians the exact same questions that elementary did. Um, and so our data is almost identical, um, which is kind of amazing. Um, so again, 18% of families said they didn't think information was easily accessible. We've already had, what, two summer school debrief <laughs> meetings to talk about how we can lower that number because we want people to feel like information is accessible um, and to not use the, well, you don't have an updated phone number, well, you don't have an updated uh, email address as an excuse, as a barrier. We have to find our way around that barrier for, for our families. Um, and then teachers were prepared and made classes fun, almost identical data to, to elementary. 97% uh, said yes, they were ready and our kids had a good time and we would send them back again next year. <clears throat> um, unlike, unlike elementary, none of them said it was too, too long. Um, they all said it was too short or just right and 36% of them want summer school to happen in July. So. Um, there might be some teachers that are like, uh, I, I need a break. Uh, and so trying to find a way to acknowledge that we have a large portion of our families that maybe want something more, but we also want to give our staff a little bit of a break and make sure that they get a, get a vacation. <clears throat> and then length of the day. I've never gotten 100% on any survey ever um, until this. 100% of them said, yes, please, make it all day long. Um, do not go back to a half day. We really enjoyed the full day. So, all right, that's it for middle school and elementary. We're now going to move into a variety of the high school programming. Um, and that's going to start with ELO, which is Extended Learning Opportunity. And just as a reminder, because 
I have to do this all the time because people will ask me a question about a certain program and I'll be like, I think you're talking about this one, but you're using this one over here because we only have, you know, 17. So extended learning opportunity is for students who receive between a 50 and a 59% in a course that they need to graduate during the semester and we literally extend the semester by 30 hours and say you have 30 more hours to prove your mastery in this content area so that you earn a D instead of earning an F. And the D is what goes on the kid's transcript instead of the F. So that's the, this is the group of we're talking about. So we run this two times a year. We run this in January, and then we run this again in June. January is for first semester courses, and then June is for second semester courses. So in January, we had almost 2,200 kids who fell into that category in qualified classes. 905 of them attended at least one hour of ELO. And then 692 of them turned their F into a D by demonstrating their skill, which is 31.47%. And so then the, the graph on the right just shows you those numbers. So the dark blue is they didn't come at all. The light blue is they came, but they didn't change their grade. So maybe they only came once. Or some kids, they actually qualify for ELO in more than one class. So they were able to change their grade in Algebra 1, but they weren't able to change it in English 1 because they ran out of time. Um, and then the yellow is they actually recovered the credit that they needed. In January, we run late busing attached to ELO, so kids can ride the late bus home. Um, but I was surprised because you're actually going to see our June data is better than our January data. And we did not provide transportation to high school kids in June. Um, I think part of the challenge in January is they go to a whole school day and then they've got to come to ELO and sometimes we're just tired. Um, and so we've talked a lot about how do we increase the understanding of what ELO is and why it's so valuable for you as a student because you might be able to recover and show mastery in this course in a day, like five hours, and instead of retaking the entire course in the entire semester. So here's the exact same program, but in June. So we had less students eligible, 2,060. 975 of them showed up at least once. And 905 of them recovered their credit. So they turned their F into a D. And so there's the exact same data, just with June instead of January. And this year, for the first time, we compacted ELO in the summer into one week. In the past, ELO in the summer has been overlapped with summer school, and so kids and staff have had to choose which one they want to participate in because they overlap. And this year, we stacked all 30 of those hours into four days for kids so that they could go to ELO and also go to summer school, and our teachers could teach ELO and then also turn around and teach summer school because we were worried if we didn't do that, we're forcing kids and staff to choose one versus the other when they might be able to do both. Right, then June Learning Center. So Learning Center is for students who have an Edgenuity credit recovery class open at the end of the year. So that means they were in one of our learning centers during the year. Maybe they were trying to recover their first semester English 3 credit and they didn't finish the course by the end of the school year. So instead of shutting the course down and saying, sorry, you gotta start all over, we let them keep doing it in June. And so that's, what the, that's for these kids um, in June. And so there were 790 students who had a course still left open at the end of the school year that they could do. We don't allow them to start any brand new ones in June, we only allow them to finish the ones that they already have open. So 556 of them did work in their Edgenuity course in the month of June. And then 283 of them completely finished the class in the month of June. So the data that you see there, it's almost a third, a third, a third. A third didn't do anything at all in their class, even though it was open. A third finished the class, and then that, and then a third did something but they didn't finish. The third that's light blue 
can continue in July. So we don't have the July data yet because it's still going on this week. So there's 273 kids that could have used the month of July to finish their class and to switch themselves from being in the light blue category to being in the yellow category. But we just don't have that data yet because it's still going on. And then, because we don't have enough yet so far, <laughs> we've got regular high school summer school, um, which you can do for original credit in PE, government, and financial literacy, or recovery credit in other courses, Algebra 1, English 1, et cetera. Um, and this was the largest high school summer school Wichita Public Schools has ever had. Um, and so here's, here's the data. Um, 1,052 kids earned credit in high school summer school this year. Um, high school summer school is that three weeks at the start of June, and they're here four hours a day for a half a credit, and some of them take a half a credit in the morning and a half a credit in the afternoon. So they're here for eight hours a day, and they earn a whole credit. Um, 349 are how many students dropped at some point. Now, reasons you dropped are variety. You decided to go on vacation. Okay, we've got to drop you because there's only 12 days to earn a credit. Um, or you know, you didn't show up for a couple days, we've got to drop you. Or, hey, there's just a variety of reasons. That drop percentage is similar to every other year. Um, we're, we have about a quarter drop rate of kids who sign up versus kids who actually finish. And that drop rate is also kids who went but didn't earn a passing grade. They earn an F in what they were doing. So, um, so 730 6.5 total credits earned, and then it's broken down versus original and credit recovery. So the 1,052 <clears throat> is kids, and then, so, but a lot of them earn like half a credit, right? So that's why you're like, why doesn't the 1,052 and the 736 and a half match? It's because 1,052 is kids, and 736 and a half are credits. 396 and a half of them were original credits, meaning those were earned in government, PE, and financial literacy. And then 340 of them were recovery credits, meaning credits that a student has passed that class, but they previously failed that class. So they've recovered the credit that they were missing. High school summer school this year took place here at North High. There are a couple IB summer school classes that are offered at East High, and then we offered a couple sections of virtual um, government and financial literacy through EIA. Um, but almost all of those kids were here at North High every single day. And we did not provide transportation for high school because there was no way we could provide transportation for high school and all of our other programs. And so we had to make some choices. Um, and so those numbers, those kids got themselves here and home every single day for 12 straight days. All right, I'm going to throw in a caveat here. The rest of the programs are, have a red header. And they have a red header because CUDA and I did not directly facilitate those programs, but we've asked those programs for data. Um, we didn't want to pull everybody out of enrollment and have everybody here. Um, and so if you ask us questions, we may or may not be able to answer, depending on what they've given us. But if we can't answer, we will go find an answer for you. I just want to throw out that caveat that we are not as well versed in the red programs as we are all the other colors um, that we've gone through. So um, Early College Academy is the partnership between Northwest and Friends University. And so there were 138 ECA students that took a class at Friends this year. And we transported those kids from their house to Friends every day to take that class. Um, and so students in the class of 2023 took a science course at Friends, and then students in the class of 2024 took a sociology class, and then students in the class of 2025 could choose between intro to art or intro to music. Uh, so 138 kids were, of our kids, current high school students were on Friends campus taking college courses this summer through ECA. <coughs> Next is our SEAT program. Um, SEAT is Summer Exploration Academy for Teens. These are ninth and 10th grade newcomer ESOL students who are enrolled at our high school, and they go to SEAT to earn a half a credit of ESOL literacy, and that's an elective credit for those students. 
Um, so you can see um, the, the yellow is they enrolled and they finished their credit, which is excellent. The light blue is they enrolled and they attended at least a day, but they didn't earn their credit. And then the dark blue is they enrolled, but they didn't actually come on any of the days. We did provide transportation for the SEAT program to North High every day they actually were here. Um, and then some, some fun facts on the side when Dr. Giesen sent them is the students that were in the SEAT program, they had six different home languages and 10 different countries of origin um, from those students just in that small population of students that was represented in our SEAT program this summer. We have our migrant summer program as well. And migrant summer program is uh, K through 12. So it spans the whole system. Um, the high school kids can earn credit. Some of them are working on original credit. Some of them are working on recovery credit. Um, and the other students are there for enrichment. It's actually not even K through 12, it's birth through 12. So um, he, here are the pieces of data for our migrant summer program. And it's typical that the older the kids, the less that number is because they've come out of the migrant program after they've been here. So, And then there's a couple pictures. Um, there's some gentlemen who were using the STEM kits to build some bridges, um, some truss bridges um, this summer. And then a young lady that was doing some s'mores from elementary summer camp WPS. And so these students, the... The K through eight students followed the same curriculum that our other summer school programs that Kuda and I talked to you about followed. They followed the exact same, exact same program. <coughs> and then our Native American program also runs a summer school that started in a program that started in 2009. Uh, it's a three week camp, but they divide it um, amongst grade levels and their capacity is 30 kids. Uh, with the staff that they have available, their capacity is 30 kids, and so you can see that they maxed out uh, their kids in K2 and 3-5, um, and then they had 23 of available 30 in 6-8. <coughs> and then we have a stealth summer program, um, which we have stealth in these schools during the year, and then they continue that program into the summer. And so for stealth, between the five, six sites, they had an average daily attendance of 217 kids there. And then total students who came, 291. They don't earn, earn credit, it's K through five, um, but the stealth is science, technology, engineering, art, leadership, tutoring, and health is what that stands for. So. They just continue the work that they do in the school year in the summertime. Then we have some programs from our Student Support Services Group. Um, so ESY stands for Extended School Year. And Extended School Year is to work with students to maintain progress on their IEP goals. So a student has to have an IEP to qualify for ESY, but not all students who have an qu IEP qualify for ESY. Um, so it's Put that caveat out there. So they, they served 374 kids in ESY this summer. And then that is, and then scope is the next one, which is, I have to write all these down, summer curriculum opportunities for personal enrichment. And so those are for students in the gifted program. And we actually use scope to serve USD 259 students and some of the surrounding school districts. And so you can see that they served 179. 118 of that 179 were our students in USD 259. And we're getting close. Within reach. So within reach is for students with disabilities who are in danger of not graduating with their cohort year because they are falling behind. And so they use a variety of computer and paper pencil. They make basically make portfolios to demonstrate mastery on content area, content areas to earn credit in those courses. And so within reach is actually still finishing up. This data is from last week. So this number, that number could have changed a bit, um, but they had 116 students. That's for um, nine through 12. 
uh, in within reach this summer, and so far that 116 students have recovered 215 and a half credits this summer. And then last but not least in terms of programs is YES, which is Youth Education Summer Socialization. Um, so to work with our students on continuing some of those social skills that they're working on during the school year throughout the summer with community partners and inclusion, and they had 103 students in their program. That's all the programs, believe it or not. We're finally through uh, all the programs that we serve for USD 259 kids. So I just want to throw out a few numbers about the scope of how large this thing is. So the next slide is the staff that we had to hire just for summer school. These are not people whose contracts extend them into the summer and happen to be working. These are 1,827 people we had to hire to make summer school happen. And we were in a meeting earlier today and um, Jenna from HR said, to put that in perspective, we typically only hire 1,600-ish new people for an entire school year. So we hired more people for summer school than we typically have to turn over and hire for a school year, is how massive of an undertaking that is. And some other little anecdotes, um, an anecdote from transportation, we had 494 bus runs every day in the month of June. Um, and there were zero major accidents or incidents on a bus this summer with 494 bus runs every single day, which is pretty amazing. <coughs> and then last but not least are some numbers from the kids. So our high school students, uh, and I put this as courses and credits because they're not the same thing because one course is a half a credit just to, to make that distinction. So. Um, 504 and a half original credits were earned by high school students this summer, and 1,498 and a half recovery credits were earned by high school students this summer with all of the credit-bearing programs combined. Um, so you look at that 2003 number, that's, that's an overwhelming number of credits earned uh, this summer from our kids. <coughs> um, total, all the kids added together, 8,230 unique kids this summer, um, which if you take out the graduating seniors, because obviously we don't have a summer program for them, they've graduated, um, that's 19.14% of our student population was served in a summer program in some capacity this year. And Cheryl actually didn't know she, she was bringing this up, but she said, you know, that's bigger than some school districts. That would make us the 12th largest school district in the state. Our summer school is the 12th largest school district in the state. Um, so when you start looking at those numbers all together, it is unbelievable um, what people were able to pull off uh, this summer and what our kids were able to accomplish. We have talked for, well, I have talked for long enough, but we are open to any and all questions that you have. Ernestine? Yes, they're waving at me, okay. Um, when um, those kids that uh, are doing the uh, completion of a credit in the summer and they don't finish it even after you add the July, do they then get the F or do they get to continue on into the fall? At some point we've got to cut it off. So they, we have, they have to restart their credit recovery in that course in the fall. So they have to restart, okay. So they don't get an F, they just have to restart it okay. from the beginning. Um, and I didn't catch what you said are the courses that are taught in summer school. I know you said government and PE, what else? So government, PE, and financial literacy are offered for original credit, um, but then there's a lot of classes that are offered for recovery credit. Okay, uh, like English and things or like English classes, PI. math classes, or er, history classes, science classes, for recovery credit. For recovery okay. credit, yes. All right. Um, and I just wanted to ha hear you say it out loud, but the early college academy at Friends University, our students didn't have to pay Friends tuition, did they? It was they, free nope. to our students. Free transportation, free tuition, 
to earn that credit. Yes, ma'am. And they got college credit as well as high school credit. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to have that out there loud and clear. Okay. Um, and then the stealth program. Who is this for as, a, as opposed to some of the other things that you were talking about? So the stealth program is it's in specific buildings. And it's um, basically, I, oh, I don't want to speak to it, because, but I think that it's pretty much in our title buildings. And so it starts as an after school program. And it is in the in the regular school year. It's an uh -huh. after school. It's an program. after school program in the regular school year. And let me get back with you okay. because I don't <laughs> want to give misinformation. Okay. Could you tell her? Could you repeat to her? And yeah. this is actually a program that is. It is actually a grant that we've written, and so the grant funds this particular program so you have a coordinator at that school and this program is during the school year and it has been extended into the summer but if you can tell her what stealth means then yeah. it kind of tells you what are some of the activities and things that they do in this program yeah. science technology engineering arts leadership tutoring health what's the t tutoring tutoring okay okay and You'll get back to me about how this differs from other programs, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. I think that's all my questions. I've got all sorts of notes here. Um, oh, about the kids on IEPs. Um, the Student Support Services Summer Programs, the YES. Are those kids with, that are on IEPs? Okay. That's what I just needed to know. Thank yes, you very much. Since I know they're probably going to wave and say verbalize what you just nodded. Thank you, Ernestine. Kathy? First of all, I want to say thank you. This is awesome, especially coming out of COVID. With these kids having this opportunity to get a jump start on the next year of their academic life, you, there was lots of good comments. And I'm wondering, is this something that might be able to kind of like go into the school year? Not specifically, but some of the things that the good feedback came, could those be integrated in you know what I'm trying to say? What Help me. Definitely in the elementary, I believe those are things that we can implement. And some of it is being implemented. Oh, good. Um, I feel like we just put a fun spin on some of it. So, Very yes. good. Yes. And for our teachers, too. And So yeah. you said you had to hire all of those teachers. Were they hired from within the district or were they hired outside of the district? We hired from within the district. And so these are educators that we saw and they haven't had any time off since the end of the school year. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, since so the end of June. Now they, they have, have three no. weeks off yes. now <laughs> until they start, but they really don't have three weeks off because I need to get into their classrooms before that. Because even the week from the time that school ended to the time that they um, started, they were in training for summer school. Okay, and we, this is not the first time that the district has offered summer school. Correct. This is just a different summer school that we have done because I'm kind of new at this. Can you help me out? So, okay, yes, they turn you. it to me. So, <laughs> um, we actually have had summer, well, let me go back. We've his, uh, typically have had some summer school going on. It was more of the smaller type of programs, maybe for special ed, ESL, you know, things of that nature. But the robust summer school programming start when we receive the ESSER dollars. So this is going into year three. We've learned from our first year. We improved our second year. And then they knocked it out of the box the third time. So we get it right at some point. But we, it took us a minute to kind of maybe look at our data to see what kids needed, to see what the teachers needed, and to try to make it as fun as we could. And this is the repercussion of year three. Now, we will try this again. Uh, next year, we still have ESSER dollars, so we will have a year four of this as well. I think this is awesome because um, a lot of our students are academically struggling right now. And I think this, I mean, I would love to see this continue every single summer until we can get every child graduated. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. Hazel? Yes, I have a couple questions. First of all, I was looking through the brochure that we were giving, given, and it mentions virtual courses. Is that part of this data? Yes, the, and the, that would be in the high school, summer school group. 
Um, they had two, they could take government or financial literacy at EIA, but it's at EIA, but virtual. They also could take that in person here at North High. Okay. So we had um, large numbers of students who were eligible for summer school. So my question is, what in the future are we going to do to try to entice more students to come and, 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 and increase their attendance? And the other one is when you, there's 4,663 in the grade 6 to 8, for, for example. So when you budget for this and you decide how many teachers you need to hire, do you use the um, an eligible amount of students to project that? Or how do, how do you determine that? So we determine staffing by students who enroll. So we actually cut off enrollment at the end of April so that we had the opportunity to do two things. One, hire staff based on how many kids had enrolled. And two, get transportation set up and make sure that was ready to go. Uh, because you can't just turn that around in a couple of days. And I think that's one of the things that Kuda and I have talked pretty extensively about is, you know, we had parents calling us once summer school. It was the first day of summer school. Hey, I saw kids getting on a bus. I want my kid in summer school. Like, that's literally what we would get. But the, to turn around and to do that um, isn't a matter of a day. Uh, yeah. it's, it's a matter of several days. And so we're trying to figure out, can we push enrollment up so that we can ha really market hard to our family so that we have a longer time to get ready and prepare and get materials and have materials ordered. But then the further you push it up, there's some families that don't recognize that it's important until we get closer to summer. But then there's some families that go, oh, I'm glad you did this early because we planned our vacation around summer school. And so that's been part of what our debrief conversations have been about is how do we increase that number um, for both elementary and middle school in terms of target population? And one of the other things we're talking about is, is it the right target population? This year, for middle school and elementary, we targeted students who scored some risk or high risk in both ELA and math. But the difference between scoring high risk and scoring, scoring some risk is massive. And so are we better off changing it and better tailoring it to the students that are maybe high risk in both because there's some activities that you're trying to design for kids in a wider spectrum of current skill level um, and so would we get better results in terms of percentage that would enroll and would attend if it was even more narrowly focused but at the same time we would also love to offer it to everybody but then if we offer it to everybody do we lose out on kids who really, really need it? And so lots of conversations about how to do that um, with our planning team and even the oper operations, facilities, transportation, nutrition services um, to try to drive some of those numbers up. Um, but at some point, we don't have the human capital to drive the number up anymore either. And so it's this really giant, delicate balancing act. But I would not say that either of us would be satisfied with the total percentage of students who enrolled for middle and elementary based on the number that were eligible. We definitely expected and wanted it to be higher. Okay, I have one last question. So is there an opportunity to follow the students who participated in the program to see how much it helped them? And is there an opportunity just those students to follow them through the school year? So for the middle school and elementary school kids, one of the things that we wanted to do once school got going again is to look at their fall fast bridge data and see what their fall fast bridge data compared to their spring fast bridge data. Knowing that there are some confounding variables because they didn't attend summer school the entire month of July, and so we wanted some immediate data, but then we also want some anecdotal uh, data and some long-term data. And some of that anecdotal data um, is from things like surveys, and then also things like SABERS. Like, did you have a really risk, high-risk SABERS score? in the fall, but then you felt more connected to school, and so you actually have a lower risk. Safer. So it's not all even necessarily academic mm -hmm. data, uh, but yes, we, that we know who those kids are, and we can look at what they're doing this fall in comparison to how they were doing last spring. And will we get, will we notify us and let us know what they're? I'm gonna be on the I mean, I'd be interested you to, to know what <laughs> the success, the success of, you know, the summer school and, and you know, how it affected the students. I yes, we would like to come back and share that um, screener data with you guys. Thank you.
Thank you, Hazel. Diane? Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, well done, and I had had a few private conversations with teachers who had participated in the summer school, and their comments really reflected what you guys presented tonight, so it was nice to have that match up. Um, so, And also, thank you for the testing scores. So getting their, their scores at the end of the school year and then testing them again at the end of summer school, that data is helpful. And I uh, follow up with Hazel. I'd, I'd like to be updated on, on the students in this cohort for summer school and to see how they progress through this next school year to make sure that that's effective learning and we're really moving the needle on academic outcomes. Um, I do have a few questions. Uh, when you guys presented this to us back in April, we had, you had given us a number of how many students were eligible for summer school, and we had asked how many were you expected to attend, and you said that would depend on the number of teachers that signed up. Do we have any issue with the number of teachers signing up and the student enrollment? So in elementary, we pretty much tapped out we were able to, we kind of hit at the end because I was allowing parents to enroll the week before, days before. She's kind of the Grinch, but I said yes when <laughs> I'm in school. And um, we got to a point where I knew a couple teachers from the past and was able to call and get them signed up. So um, we really tapped out, but we did, a, we did a good job of it. I mean, it wasn't ever a point where we were afraid that we wouldn't have enough teachers. Okay, very so. good. And then... Oh, go ahead. For, for middle school, um, we actually got to a point where our enrollment data and our hiring data, were try we were trying to do them both at the same time. And so we kind of said, go ahead and hire kind of baseline eight teachers. And so like Wilbur had one of the smaller programs. And so they had eight classrooms running. So their ratio was smaller than the CMA program who actually had 10 classrooms running, but they had double the kids that Wilbur did. So they still had great staff ratios because there was a teacher and a para in every room, but their staff ratio wasn't as low as Wilbur's. Um, so we actually did fine in terms of middle school and wiggle room. Um, high school, we, we tapped it out. We, for the number of kids and the number of courses we had to offer, granted high school is a different beast because I need a biology teacher to teach this biology class. Um, and so, but we, yeah, we tapped out on high school. That's, that's about as big as we can get in terms of staff we had available. Okay, very good. And then you mentioned earlier um, identifying high risk versus low risk students. Do you have those numbers of, for this summer school of how many students were high risk versus low risk? Like, did we have 80% of high risk students participating in summer school or? So we have the data for high risk and some risk. Mm -hmm. And that is definitely data that we could pull together and okay. give numbers on. Okay. I'm just curious on it yeah. just to, mm -hmm. because you brought it up. Um, and then, yeah, we already hit on the long-term data. Okay. Thank you very much. That was a good presentation. Thank you, Diane. Cheryl? Thank you both. Thank you for your hard work and for your diligence to put this together. You literally ran a school district in the summer, and that's not easily overlooked. You guys did great work along with all the team that you assembled. Um, I, I have been around summer school and watched this for a long time. We've never had a program like this that was so focused on catching kids up and keeping them from sliding. We've had lots of programs that particularly at the high school that did that but at the elementary and middle schools most of our programs were keep kids entertained and fun and have a good summer and all that. That's not what this was at all. So I, I think we've set a pattern that's gonna be hard to live up to, but by the same token, I know we can do it. And, and you've set the model now of what we wanna do in future summers. Um, I know this was funded with ESSER funds, and one of the pieces that's not in here is how much this cost us. And you know, to me, that's a bit, uh, we have the money, we have the ESSER funds, but we, when we look two years down the road, three years down the road and don't have ESSER, we do want to look at how much this costs and how do we maintain, because the need isn't going to go away. We're still going to have kids that are behind. So if we could have some data on 
expenses and the kinds of things so that we can, in the future, begin to look at what, what gives us the most uh, uplift f in, with, with group. So um, I, I, one of the things that's kind of been sliding around the table is how do we get kids involved? I think the fact that we've had, and you show the, the data of the parents that love this and one of their kids in it, word of mouth is gonna grow this program. You know, and starting the enrollment a little earlier might not be a bad thing because it gives our district a chance to run things on our channel, to send out information, all those kinds of things. Because when you've got a program that's this successful, parents are gonna find out, word of mouth. So I would anticipate next year will be even bigger. <laughs> um, I like the idea that you're using the fast bridge data from spring uh, to fall, because even though that's not exact data, it certainly is data that will help us see if, it's, if this has worked. So I appreciate your willingness to do that. And I, I think that I too have talked to several teachers teachers who would come up to me and talk about the summer program without my even prompting them. They had worked in it, they felt like it was worth their time, they enjoyed the extra money, but mostly they enjoyed seeing how kids are gaining and that they would be coming back to them in the fall or to another teacher, not behind near as much as when they left in the spring, which we've never had that opportunity before. So great program, wonderful report, thank you so very much. Thank you, Cheryl. Julie, do you have any questions or comments? I don't have anything additional. I just want to echo everyone else's enthusiasm and support and thanks uh, for this great program and everyone's hard work. So thank, thank you for the great report. Thank you, Julie. And um, I, I must say that the, uh, the summer schools that I visited this summer um, you get the same feeling at this at the summer school as you do with a lot of our after school programs. I don't know if our after school programs, uh, I know they're dedicated to stealth and a few other programs. I'm not sure if they're dedicated quite as focused as we were on this summer, but I'm not gonna make an official request or anything, but plant a seed that perhaps, uh, the board obviously is very interested in what happened this summer. Um, and maybe we could follow that up uh, with a uh, board meeting down the road where we talk about our uh, after school programs because the, the way I always tell people is if you love our summer programs, you'll love our after school programs as well. So maybe that's something we can uh, put on future agendas. Thank you very much for this report. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick, next item, please. Next item, Road Trip Nation, Workforce Hub, and Documentary. And I'll have Dr. Thompson introduce this topic. So this is kind of like a, a dream come true. We've been working on this in our community for a little while. Um, this is a project that encompasses quite a few people in our community. And we are just excited to be a part of it. And I know the gentlemen that are coming um, are going to have the opportunity to share with us more about this particular project and the opportunities that it will bring uh, for our students, and not just our students, but our, our community as a whole. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Thompson, and thank you, uh, board members, for having us here tonight. My name is Kelly Bielefeld. I am the Executive Director of College and Career Readiness uh, at Wichita Public Schools, and we're here tonight to share about um, an initiative called Road Trip Nation, uh, which is probably something uh, you may not have heard of before, um, but Mr. Long and I have been working uh, about a year now on laying the groundwork for this, and we're excited to launch it. Um, so I'm going to let Keith give us a uh, kind of a big picture overview of the origins of the project, who our partners are, and then I will take uh, the second part of this and talk about the nuts and bolts and the actual things that are going to happen uh, here soon with the Road Trip Project. So I'll let Keith introduce himself. Great, thank you, Kelly. And uh, Keith Loin, I'm the President and CEO of the Workforce Alliance of South Central Kansas. Uh, President Reeser, uh, Superintendent Thompson, and board members, it is a pleasure to be here today. Uh, it's been a while since I've addressed the board. There are a few new members here. Welcome to you all. Thank you for your service. 
And you may not be familiar with the Workforce Alliance. I will not go into detail about who we are. That's probably better for a different presentation. But we have a long history of working with the school district uh, on a number of different projects over the years. And I certainly want to credit Dr. Thompson for her continued commitment to this partnership. Um, I want to quickly recognize two former uh, district employees who really helped build the foundation uh, for what we're doing, what we're going to talk about today. And one's Jim Means, uh, who was Kelly's predecessor, predecessor here. Uh, Jim, <coughs> just fantastic partner, and also Diane Faflick. Um, both have since left the district. Their replacements have just been fantastic. Obviously, Kelly and uh, Laura Barker, I want to compliment them for the ongoing work that we've been able to continue. And interesting to hear about the summer stuff, because I'd love to come back and talk to you about some of the things we've been doing on the summers uh, with the district as well. Um, but the, um, <clears throat> uh, the Road Trip Nation project, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it has been around for a very long time, about 15 years. Uh, it, it ends up being a documentary on, on PBS, but there's a lot of background information that goes into that. That's really what we're excited about. And when I first heard about Road Trip Nation, um, I knew what they were doing. I mean, some of my colleagues in sh cities like Chicago or Houston, Philadelphia, Silicon Valley are either initiating Road Trip Nation projects or just completed them. And, and Kelly gave me a call and said, heard about these guys. What do you think? I'm like, well, let's start a conversation with them. Let, let's get them on, you know. And, and as soon as we started talking to them, you know, my first thought was, well, you know, we're Wichita, and they're looking for scale, bigger communities. They were incredibly excited about the things we were telling them what was going on in this community. Uh, the, the, the partnerships with the school district, our post-secondary education institutions, and business and industry. And really looking at Wichita as the air capital of the world and asking, what's next? What are you going to do now? You know, and, and that was the story that we are really excited to be telling about and having some of our students help us tell that story. So um, the thing about Road Trip Nation, it is public television. Um, they are a not-for-profit organization. This is not a huge money-making endeavor where they're coming in. And so we had to raise funds to bring them here. Uh, and I, as Kelly said, um, it was a, a lot of legwork. But when we started talking to partners, there was a great deal of interest. And I, I just want to quickly mention who our funding partners are. One is the Kansas Department of Commerce and not the Kansas Department of Education, the Department of Commerce, because what they are looking to do is how we can build work-based learning opportunities to engage business and industry in the classroom. They looked at the Road Trip Nation project as a way to build on that kind of strategy uh, and were very willing funders to, to help us get this started. The Strata Foundation, which uh, Road Trip helped bring us, but they were very interested in these kind of, uh, uh, planting these kind of seeds in uh, communities all around the country. Um, then we had strong commitments from WSU Tech, uh, compliment Dr. Utash, and uh, Wichita State University. Uh, Dr. Muma and his team saw a great benefit to this. And certainly coming to the district, Dr. Thompson and her team were interested in this. Uh, compliments go to our business community. Uh, Techstar and Aviation stepped up and uh, wanted to make an investment. Uh, the Bank of America Foundation uh, stepped up as well, as did Spirit Aerosystems. Uh, so we were able to raise the money uh, that we needed to uh, get this project started. Uh, and again, just could not be more pleased. Um, Kelly's going to show you some of the details. I'd be happy to answer some questions once we get into it. But I will tell you just on a personal level, um, as a, a, a long time, a lifelong Wichita, as a product of Wichita Public Schools, uh, when I saw a couple of the videos that the students made, I, a tear to my eye. I mean, the, the potential impact is so significant and just made me so proud uh, to be part of this collaboration. And so very excited to be able to roll this out to you all tonight, looking forward for a lot of the potential outcomes we can build on and really make this an integral part of how we uh, work with children, our students and kids, and, and job seekers through uh, across the region. So, so Kelly, I hope I didn't miss anything, and I'll kind of hand it over to you for now. Well, and if I forget anything, uh, feel free to chime in, Keith. So. So what is it? What are, what are we talking about? What is this, this project? So it, there's actually three phases to it. The first phase, um, as of a few days ago, has gone live. And this is a workforce hub. It's a website um, that Road Trip Nation has helped us to create. It's tailored to our region's needs. Um, so uh, it, it's also slick and, and fancy and looks nice and way better than anything I could have ever created, right? Um, 
In that website, we have uh, five videos that were recorded of local Wichita uh, products, Dr. Thompson being one of them. She has an awesome video on there. Um, Dr. Muma at WSU, uh, Karen Carter, who works for Dow. She lives in Atlanta now, but she was an East High grad. Uh, Jason Cox and Luis Rodriguez. So we had our students, well, one of our students and then a student from um, Argonia, another uh, school in the region, that actually interviewed these uh, um, local celebrities about their career path, about their job and what they like about it, what inspires them and why they chose the career they did. So th those videos live on the hub along with a number of calls to action for young people, um, Workforce Center website, Wichita Public Schools College and Career Ready website, um, Zello, our individualized plan of study link, um, links to things for FAFSA. So. The idea of the website is to have a one-stop shop for a young person. If I'm between 16 and 24 years old and I live in the Wichita region and I don't know what to do with my life, here's where you go. You go and you have resources here and you can, you can research careers and you can find not only the local videos that we have, um, but a whole bank of videos that Road Trip Nation has created over the last 15 or 20 years. Um, so. What is it? The website, target audience, I covered that. The objective, the idea is to, you know, by centralizing the access to many of these opportunities, young people will have an easier time finding the support they need on their career journey. Um, next Monday at 1 o'clock will be our big launch that Keith is uh, planning um, with a lot of our funders and a lot of the people in the videos and Nikaya, who is our intern, who worked with Media Services this year, who did the a few of the interviews. Um, so that will all be coming soon. Um, it, it, it's a live website now. Uh, the tech people up there told me I can't click on the website because it won't show up up there. But um, I'd be happy to share the link with you and you can watch the videos and see what it's all about. So that's the Workforce Hub. So that's kind of stage one. Stage two um, is just getting underway. Um, stage two will be a 60-minute documentary about our region and the jobs in our region. So this will air on PBS uh, all across the nation. Um, it will uh, highlight... Um, the business and industries of our region. Um, so everything from agriculture to aviation to manufacturing. And there will be three young people, three road trippers, uh, that will be you know, local products who will be um, the, the kids on this green Winnebago driving around. Um, you know, and it'll be, you know, they aren't going to be on the Winnebago the whole time, but that's what it'll look like on the documentary. Um, they'll be, you know, driving around, basically engaging people about how did you find this career? How did you end up here? Tell us about your career journey. What do you love about Wichita? What do you love about, you know, working here? And what do you see the future? Um, the, the idea being, you know, marketing internally to our kids to keep them here and say, Wichita's got a lot to offer. Um, but it, it'll be a nationwide documentary aired on PBS all across uh, the country um, and hopefully will appeal to um, a lot of young people that think, you know, we're, we're cowboys who ride horses to school every day and that sort of thing. Um, they'll see a, a high-tech advanced manufacturing sector. They'll see... Um, the biggest aviation uh, industry per capita in the, in the nation. Um, and then a mix of lots of other odds and ends too, probably. Um, a lot of the content control is, you know, the producers decide that. We've been, you know, giving suggestions up to this point. Um, so we're not exactly sure what it'll end up looking like. But that should be, uh, they're telling us early 2023, uh, that should be live and um, coming to a PBS station near you. Uh, Kelly, could I make sure. another ahead, quick Keith. point on that? Um, some of the reaction I got when I first started talking about this was PBS, some random Wednesday night. What are we getting out of this? I mean, is anybody really going to watch this thing? Um, but I think in the what I would call the YouTube era right now, a video content and have a longer life and you can do it differently. And the one, what are the way the Road Trip Nation folks are going to film this? It's going to be in a chapter kind of format. So you can have a standalone segment that can be five minutes and then it can live in its own video. You do not have to watch the entire thing. It will be able, uh, teachers and counselors will be able to break it up and use it in the classrooms in, in a small format. And, and, and I just want to emphasize uh, and Kelly said it's going to go a little bit beyond just the, the Wichita uh, uh, area in a sense that we're going to look at and we're, we're telling the road trip folks what there is here and they will make the choices where we go. But for example, there's a Pfizer plant in McPherson making the COVID vaccine right now. 
I don't think a lot of our students know that's going on in this community. And, and McPherson is, is pretty much Wichita. I mean, you know, it's in that labor market here. Where we, we, we share a labor force here. Um, we're going to look at things going on in the ag community right now uh, with technology and how jobs are changing and different. So, um, so that is going to be one of the, the, the advantages is that even though this will be a, a one-hour documentary that will air on PBS, it will have a very long shelf life to the way it's going to be packaged, promoted, and then it really, and this is why we're having this kickoff, we want our teachers, we want our, 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 our folks to know about this tool out there so they can choose to use it in their classrooms how they see, think it's going to work the best. So just wanted to throw that out there about the documentary. Yep. Thank you, Keith. And then the last piece of the road trip puzzle uh, is what's called the roadmap. So this is a curriculum that's specifically for high school kids. Um, it's five lessons that are free and accessible on the Road Trip website. And um, the idea is that the students watch the videos, research careers, and might find something that sparks their interest. And then they conduct one of these career interviews as part of a project-based learning experience um, that then gets shared with, with their class or their school or wherever they want to share it. So next week, uh, Right after August 1st, when we launched the hub, uh, we have the KACTE conference, which is the statewide CTE conference going on here in Wichita. So on Tuesday of next week, uh, we'll be sharing with all the CTE educators in the state, uh, Diane Smokorowski and I, uh, through a keynote presentation, how to use this curriculum, along with sharing it with our own teachers uh, at our professional learning later in, later in the fall. So um, this is kind of for us, you know, what's the type, a lot of the, the first two pieces are kind of workforce, future, you know, what does that look like for our kids? This is really where the rubber meets the road for our kids. And this idea that when they see Nakaya's interview with Dr. Thompson, they were like, well, that's cool. I, I think I might want to be a judge. I'm going to go find a judge, and I'm going to research that career, and then go interview that and conduct that same sort of interview about that career path. Um, so again, that's a, a free curriculum that's open to all of, all of high school. It's currently open, but we're going to do some specific targeted training and really try to make you know, my goal at the end of you know, May 2023 will be every high school kid in WPS recognizes the green Winnebago, right? They know Road Trip Nation, they've been on the hub, they've done the, you know, experienced the curriculum and watched some of the video uh, that goes along with it. So um, last thing, you know, what, what's our role in this? Um, well, for one, it's, it's funding. Um, this was a, originally a consent item because this is coming from Perkins funds and other grant funds. So this isn't coming from any general, uh, general fund expenditure. But because of uh, what it was, um, Gil said, I think we should explain this to the board because it's a little, uh, you know, somewhat unique and different than what we usually do. So um, part of our commitment to the project is funding. Part of our commitment to the project is promotion. Um, so hopefully you all continue to uh, share on social media and, you know, talk about, uh, you know, this road trip project and what it means for South Central Kansas. Um, and then teaching and us using the, the curriculum in the classroom. Those are really the kind of the three main components of how uh, WPS is engaged in it. Um, but it's it, because, you know, Keith and I uh, have kind of been on the ground floor with this and kind of building it together. You know, WPS websites uh, front and center on the hub. Uh, WPS students are conducting the interviews. Uh, we really hope WPS, the imprint, you know, we're the, we're the largest producer of employment for the region, uh, WP, uh, Wichita Public Schools. So um, we wanted there to hopefully be a distinct flavor of how important our schools are to the, this workforce development that we're talking about. So um, do you have anything else, Keith? Was there anything I uh, Happy to answer questions. Just again, we're very excited and thank you for uh, you know all your support, not only in this project, for the collaboration we've had with the school district for many years now. And we do have some questions. Uh, Kathy. Thank you both. Your enthusiasm definitely is shown. I can see your excitement in this, and I'm sure it's at the potential of what this could happen. I do have a few questions because your enthusiasm, I was caught up in it. So, I, um, Who are the students accountable to if they are in this program? And is this program part, you said curriculum, is this part of a grade? Is this part, I know it's an opportunity, but you know, when you take English, you get so many credits. When you take math, you get credits for this? Well, so the curriculum is five lessons. So it can be done, you know, every other week throughout a semester. It could be done all in one week. So we're not talking about an entire class of curriculum. We're just talking about five lessons. 
we will be encouraging our CTE teachers um, who use a lot of career exploration as part of their curriculum already to be the ones that, that administer this. But any kid, any high school kid could go on, create a login, and go do this today if they wanted to. So uh, it's free and open curriculum. It's not, it's not um, that you know, there's credit associated with it. We just want to encourage the kids to do it. Um, you know, I, I didn't mention this, but this is strategic goal you know, number three of our strategic plan, college and career readiness. Yeah, you can't be ready for something if you don't know what you're preparing for. So as you, to think about your career and the path you want to have, I mean, that's really kind of the whole point of exposing them to this. Maybe that kid that goes and interviews the judge realizes that job's really boring and I don't <laughs> want to do that job. Well, that's a success because it comes back to their plan and what they want to do. So, um, but the curriculum is not, it's not a whole class. It's just be something we would embed in a class. Do they give a report on these interviews then? Well, the, the, the final product is the video. Is the video, okay. Yeah, they, they create okay. that video. Um, and now what they do with that is really up to kind of the teacher. We've talked about, you know, creating a website as a district. If we really get a lot of energy going with this, we could put them all in one place. But they may just live within, you know, we show it to the class and then, and then we're done. Okay, so. I have just a few more. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> On the uh, third slide, compared to the fourth slide, uh, the target is 16 to 24 year olds, and down here it's 14 to 18 year olds. What's the difference? Well, so the, the roadmap curriculum is specifically made for high school kids. The overall vision for the documentary and the hub is really young people in the area and, and outside of the area. So um, this is not just limited to high school. It's not just 16 to 18 year olds that, I mean, six, starts at 16 because that's when you can enter the workforce. Um, but 16 to 24 year olds was our target demographic um, when it comes to uh, the, creating the documentary and how they do that and how they tailor it. So and, and I'm just gonna build on that a little bit. for. Um, this is a way that we're leveraging these partnerships together because what's going to be advantageous for Kelly and the district and the classroom, I'm going to be able to use this for my job seekers who are coming into my facility and, and are looking for similar information. And we are really placing a focus on that, uh, what I would call that opportunity youth segment, uh, those 18 to 21 year olds that are might be a, a, a detached from the workforce or from school? Um, how do we get them engaged again? How, how do we give them some tools and some opportunities? And, you know, what we're going to see, what you all will see when you get a chance to check out these videos, is the power of the storytelling. Um, it, it, it is, you know, and being able to envision yourself in those situations. And so this is where uh, the benefit of the Road Trip Nation project will not only be within the school districts, but within the community overall. Um, and again, so the way they've built it up, you, you can have focus of it in the classroom, but it also can an individual who's just looking or one of my job counselors, we can have somebody, you know, as part of their individual employment plan, we use an IEP in a different context, um, uh, do this as something to they can figure out what it is they want to do uh, as we can direct them in their, in their next step on their career journey as well. So it'll, it'll, it'll be uh, something that is very relevant in the classroom, but also relevant outside of the classroom within that age demographic we're trying to target. Okay, just one more. Um, the Winnebago. Um, how many are there and are they ever driven up to the high school so the students that might be interested could go and and what's inside of it? Is it like cameras and <laughs> <laughs> techie stuff? Well, the, the way the, the entire thing started was um, the founder of it, uh, whose name is Mike, who's been very hands-on with the project. Um, he graduated from college and didn't know what he wanted to do and he had a, a, this green Winnebago and he literally just started driving around and interviewing, creating these, these videos, just asking people about you know, how they overcame struggles in life and where the, how did they end up where they are in their path and just telling those stories. And it's kind of blossomed into um, this TV show and all these uh, ancillary supports that they do. Um, all about what Keith said, you know, that storytelling about our career path. You know, some of us, if you watch Dr. Thompson's video, you'll see a somewhat linear career path, right? You know, I, I, I wanted to be a teacher. I knew I wanted to be a teacher, and I became a teacher. Um, but a lot of career paths don't go that way, right? They go all sorts of directions. And so we want every kid to know that when you hit roadblocks or when you have struggles in life, um, that you need to persevere and you need to keep going. And as they hear stories of people doing that, that will help inspire them, hopefully, to, to persevere and see it through. So. And can we go to the website and look at it? And what's the link? Yes. Um, well, the link is here. Um, but 
I will. Well, that that's not the actual link. So let me send it. Um, it's send if it we, what we'll do is we'll send it to Patrick, and then Patrick right. will get it to you all. I would Perfect. love to go to the website yeah. and look at it. Thank you so much. And it's oh, the the website's open August first, right? It's actually open. It's live now. Oh, it is. Um, okay. We haven't launched it, so to speak, and really publicized it. But yeah, it's it, it opened around July first. It's so. like when you open a restaurant and you just have your friends and family come the first few days <laughs> to make it. sure everything's good before you announce it to the public. So we're you friends and family go look at the site. You know, <laughs> and then we'll let everyone listening else to this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thank you, uh, Hazel. I just have a couple questions. Thank you for your presentation. Did you did I understand that it would be students who would be inter doing the interviews, and how if so how will you be choosing the students that will be participating in the program? So the the recorded interviews on the hub are already done, and those were high school students. The road trip documentary those are eighteen year old plus. So those they might be a former Wichita student, but they're not going to be any of our current students. We are right now in the process of sharing the application all over the place. So if you know of a young person who's 18 to 25, who's charismatic and likes telling stories, likes talking to people, um, the application closes August 14th. Um, Road Trip Nation, will, they will select um, you know, the, the final three uh, people that, that, because they're looking for kind of different things when it comes to the production value of it, um, with our input, so to speak. And we've, we've talked about um, the kind of diversity we'd like to see uh, both um, you know, gender and race and all of that, but also even diversity amongst a region, you know, that, it, that spans, you know, up all the way up to McPherson, um, you know, in, down to the heart of Wichita. So um, they will have final say on who those people are, uh, but right now um, we're trying to share on social media as much as possible uh, that it's an open application process for anyone who's 18 years or older. So it's open now. They can go and apply now. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And that's another link that we can get to Patrick and send out. Because okay. if you know of somebody that you think would be great for it, um, I mean, they kind of it's it's kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity, and you get to be on, you know, you're TV. On. Yeah, you're on TV. I mean, it's you know, some kids well, aspire to do that. And so. one of the links that we'll make sure that you guys get to see is um, an example of a project they did in Indiana. It was Indiana State of Change, um, and you'll get a sense of kind of what we're looking for in terms of the profile of the road trippers. Um, you know, it's just hard not to fall in love with those kids. And again, much like we heard earlier from the presentation, some of the comments, uh, some of the young people who experienced the summer school camps, just the learning about those career opportunities and those jobs, things they never even knew about, you know, that, that's what this is really going to be uh, at the heart of it. I, I think you'll see a lot of kids saying, wow, I did not know that was out there. Not only for the kids who end up being on the road trip, but for the young people who actually access the hub and start learning about some of the things on the hub. I have one more question. Do you know, uh, you said, where did you say there, this was taking place in Indiana? Is that what you said? Oh, it, it, the, the project I was specifically talking about was from Indiana. They've done, they have a whole library of examples of these road trips, and that was just one that when we were looking at what the, this project would look like, it would be similar in structure to what they did in Indiana. But this is our first yeah, this it. is our first one here. Okay. I mean, you know, yeah, the first time they've been in this market. Um, so again, we're, we're just very excited. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Diane? Thank you for the presentation. Very good information. I just have a few questions. Um, it says at the very beginning that, that this is to inspire young people to find a meaningful career path. How how many different ways are we helping them find a career path? Is it just through the stories and the videos, or are there like personality profiles to, to kind of help narrow down for the student, like you might be interested in these types of career paths, or tell me a little bit more about that. Well, there's a few different moving parts to it, um, and, and certainly uh, the video will be part of it, uh, you know, identifying with, with people in your community, business leaders, community leaders, you know, so that, that'll be one way to hear their story. Um, the other is that there is a lot of content that Road Trip Nation's bringing to us already. So they're gonna be building those things into the hub. There'll be labor market information. You know, I say sometimes it's the old Jerry Maguire argument, show me the money. 
Um, you know, so what does this profession pay? What does it take to get into it? Um, and then it will also leverage what the district's already doing, and Kelly mentioned the Zello uh, a tool that we have, the Career Awareness Pathway. Um, other school districts have other of those Career Awareness, so it will be leveraging some of that in there as well. Uh, so there will not be just a single way, a linear way, but it'll, it's more of a lattice approach in how we uh, uh, try to uh, do that, uh, that inspiration and that, that knowledge piece. And Kelly, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. Yeah, just quickly. Um, that's another link. We'll, so we'll send you a bunch of links. Um, the roadmap curriculum, you know, day one of that curriculum is um, it's, it's an interest inventory of sorts where it says, you know, what do you like to do? And there's 40 things there and you pick two. And then what are you, what are you good at? And you pick a couple things there. And then it starts from there and kind of filters down to a couple careers. And then the kids, you know, the, the project is then you dig into those and start watching the videos and start looking at, you know, quality of life and how much money I'm going to make and where could I do this and all that sort of thing. So we do that within Zello a lot already, but there is kind of a smaller component within this project that would do that too. Okay, very yeah. good. And then how many different videos are going to be uploaded to our website? Is this going to be a revolving thing where there's constantly new videos being uploaded all the time? Or well, we are um, we're somewhat unique in Wichita that I think we're the first group that's that's done both the hub and the road trip together at the same time. So what Keith was talking about the chapter, the way they're recording the the documentary by chapters, those will then become embedded in the hub, so that we'll expand what we have. Right now, to launch the hub, we, you know, as part of the agreement or whatever, we were given five uh, community leaders and videos. Uh, but we've actually talked to, to Road Trip about, you know, if we were to come up with more funding from somewhere, could we could we create more of those videos? Because um, we had we had community leaders that we we know would be amazing at that that didn't get. You know, we had to pick five. So um, and, and that you know. And between us and them, that's kind of the five we settled on. But we had another 15, you know. I mean, we had a whole a whole other list that we could go to. So that's another thing that might be in the works that's not for sure yet if we create more videos. But, but the documentary videos will become implanted within the hub after it's finished, too, to create... Uh, a better a better workplace hub than anybody else has ever had because we have all of that put together. So now we have our own communications department that edits our videos and and does quite well. Are those things that we can upload to that website ourselves? Like if we do the video, could mm -hmm. we upload that to that website? I don't know that answer. Yeah, <laughs> you know that answer? And, and, and there's a possibility there. I, I think you know one of the things with the road trip folks, and I really appreciate uh, their willingness is. Some of this is we're doing uncharted uh, territory for them. There is not, of the projects I mentioned, there is not a school district that is as involved in the project as we have here. And that is another reason that they were really pleased to be in this market because of the partnership that we brought to the table. A lot of times, it is not the school districts that are at the table. So, uh, and I did, to, to your point, that's one of the first things I asked Kelly. I'm like, wait a five? All we get is five? I, I, I need 20. I got 20 people. I want at least 25 maybe, you know, different areas that would be, that I felt would be very inspirational. And so we have that possibility is how can we build that hub? Now, one of the things is, is that we got to balance that really professional approach by the, 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 the tech experts and the student who's going to be doing the video. You know, so, so how do we make it real and how do we balance that out? So, so we hope, I mean, that's one of the reasons we're talking to you all is that we want you, you, we want you all to figure out how this fits into the strategies, the plans you all have as a board for the district and either uh, give us the green light to go ahead and continue to do it provide funding if we need it. Right now, we're trying not to come to you all, ask more for more funding. Uh, we think there's a need in the community and we can find funders to help us do this and leverage the great work you're already doing. Uh, so we hope this is just the beginning and that we can build on this and, and really grow it and give it a very long shelf life. Okay, thank you. Cheryl, do you have any questions or comments? have to turn my mic on, sorry. Um, this is a project where it's kind of a, very much a win-win because it's our business community who want to produce workers that, that they can immediately take into their companies and use effectively. And it's us trying to provide the kinds of things that students can, can do. Many of our students will go on to college, not all of them will. But that doesn't mean that they can't find good, well-paying 
jobs within our community. So I think the more opportunities we take to explore this, and I realize that the, the video itself is a national company coming in and doing it. But that's really kind of a piece of it. We really want to build and continue to have this relationship with our community because I think that's what helps our kids and it helps our businesses in our community and we all go gain and grow because of it. So I, I'm, I'm excited about this. I'm anxious to see it, see how it works. Um, but I still say the work that we're doing within our, our school district and within our community with our businesses, that really is a unique mm -hmm. piece and we really don't want that to go away. So thank you both of you for your hard work. Yeah, it, it'll build on that. Let me just, another point we didn't really bring up. We haven't talked about the post-secondary angle, uh, but for Wichita State University in particular, um, they're recruiting all along the I-35 corridor. We want to get these videos in classrooms in Oklahoma City, mm -hmm. in, in Fort Worth, in Kansas City, in Minneapolis, to demonstrate what's going on here in this, in this uh, region, um, these educational opportunities, the, the uh, uh, career opportunities, to your point. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, this is a place where we have different benefits to this project by different partners. Um, and again, I think that's where we'll really be able to sustain and, and hopefully find some additional funding if we need funding uh, to build on what I feel is going to be a tremendously successful project. Thank you. Julie, do you have any questions or comments? No questions. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Dr. Thompson, you started to, oh, I'm sorry. Ernestine, sorry. As this board knows, I'm just tremendously excited about this district's career and technical education opportunities. And I'm forever trying to get Dr. Thompson to put up billboards all over the city because it's amazing the people that do not know what we're doing. They have no idea. You know, Hazel and I have talked about that when we say, hey, they're building an airplane at North High, and they go, what? We have such cool stuff happening. It is a model all the way up the I-35 corridor. We are doing things here already that are, that are models for school districts all over everywhere. So one of the things that I want to say thank you because now we'll get a little bit of publicity for this cool stuff we're already doing. <laughs> so, and if you know anybody that will help us pay for the billboards, I never mind. <laughs> Well, more to come in September about uh, marketing and promotion of CTE programs. We, we have some things in the works. Yeah. Well, I know, but Dr. Thompson has always said, well, we can't spend any money that needs to be spent on the kids on that kind of thing. Yeah. So I've, I've already told her that I'll go out with my little satchel and I'll go to, <laughs> you know, to the different banks and the different businesses in town because I really do think that there's an awful lot of people that do not know the kind of just dramatic things that have begun to happen here in the last four to five years max, three years I would say, that it's really, we need to, he that tooteth not his own horn, get his own horn not tooteth. <laughs> <laughs> That's my mantra. <laughs> On your point, it's very true. Wichita, South Central Kansas, the Wichita Public School District, our, some of our larger employers, we're finally learning how to emphasize what we're good at. And we're no longer afraid to brag about ourselves. And so I think this is good. I think this is a good program, like you just said, Keith. Uh, we're basically leveraging what we're already doing and so uh, I appreciate the uh, information. Appreciate your work, Keith, on the South Central Workforce Center. And thanks again, Kelly. All right. All right. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Thompson. And I just want to make sure that we are always linking our partnerships and our work to our strategic plan. Yeah. Um, because we would not go out and generate projects that don't link. This fits with your um, ensuring that our students have access to college and career um, exploration. It also is for our, our dual and concurrent classes and credentialing. Um, this also helps us um, 
give kids opportunities and choices as we promised we would do in our strategic plan. When we did the listening session four years ago, it was very clear that our community wanted us to move in this direction and we took big strides to be able to do that. And thanks to our partners and uh, Kelly, um, we, we are starting to move in some of the um, some ways in which we uh, needed to build infrastructure to get your goal um, to its fullest potential. So I just wanted to make sure we link that. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Um, you. Patrick, before you call the next item, I think we'll take a five minute break, if it's okay with the board. And we'll be back at eight o'clock. Thank you all. Thank you, Keith. The school board is now back in session from their uh, break. Uh, Patrick, next item, please. Next item, consent. Um, I am going to pull D5, which is the East High Science Wing Project. Uh, Diane, do you have any items to pull? I do not. Ernestine? I do not. Julie, do you have any consent items to pull? Nothing to pull. Uh, Kathy? I do not. Uh, er Ernest, I guess two Ernestine. Right. Sorry, Cheryl. Hey, it's okay. That. You can call me Ernestine anytime. It's <laughs> no. fine. <laughs> Cheryl? Uh, I have nothing to pull. Thank you. Hazel? Yes, I'd like to pull D1 and 7. D1 is the adult ESOL students renewal and, I'm sorry, what was the second one? Rainbows. Seven. Rainbows United. Okay, thank you. I move that we adopt the consent agenda except for D1, D5, and D7. I second. Moved by Stan Reeser, seconded by Kathy Bond. Uh, we'll do a show of hands. All those in favor, raise your hand. Julie, how do you vote? Yes. Motion carries 7-0. Okay. Uh, I on D5, uh, Dr. Thompson, I was wondering if you if we'd be prepared to give the board kind of a quick update since this is a l very large ongoing project and a very necessary project uh, at East High. I was wondering if Luke or any of your staff could give us kind of an update on this project. Absolutely. Um, Mr. Newman is here, and I also would like to recognize the principal uh, in the audience, if you would wave so that everyone knows, and thank you for being here uh, to support us this evening. So without further ado, oh, there's Luke, right there. Luke yeah. Newman is available. We're here to kind of just give you kind of the scale of what's going to be happening. And you have um, some slides for us? Yes, sir. Okay, yes. wonderful. Right. Thank you. I appreciate you being prepared for this. Yeah, Go was, ahead, Luke. I was really hoping you'd pull this so much Good. so that I put the presentation together for you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so good evening, Dr. Thompson, President Reeser, and members of the board. Uh, I'm Luke Newman. I'm the Director of Facilities, and I'm here to provide you with a brief update on East High School, uh, the Science Wing, and present the final guaranteed maximum price for the project. So to quickly recap, uh, this project is a result of structural issues identified in the East High School Science Wing uh, back in late 2021, which led to us vacating the building. Uh, in December of 2021, we hired Schaefer Johnson Cox Fry to provide design services for the project while also deciding to utilize uh, the CM at risk delivery method. McCown Gordon was selected as the contractor in early 2022 and immediately started collaborating with Schaefer Johnson Cox Fry on scope and budget. And I would like to just recognize uh, Mitch Binns, who's a representative here tonight with McCown Gordon. Thanks for being here tonight, Mitch. Uh, an early bid package was approved by the board uh, last month for roofing and HVAC equipment in the interest of mitigating potential schedule impacts associated, associated with long manufacturer lead times. Late last month, design documents uh, reached the point of completion for all scopes of work to be competitively bid and a final GMP established. So the final scope of work uh, has grown beyond what was initially anticipated. In addition to addressing the known uh, structural remediation measures, we will be installing a new roof in order to address uh, drainage issues and their associated uh, load impact. 
replacing all windows, installing a new fire sprinkler system uh, due to updated code requirements, and reconfiguring interior finishes to accommodate ADA requirements and other considerations. Uh, we're also installing a new HVAC system rather than reusing what is currently there. The reason for that is because the existing system uh, is about 20 years old now. Uh, and it'll need to be demoed in order to conduct the structural remediation repairs. Uh, so the decision was, to, was made to replace the system rather than replacing a 20-year-old system uh, that was already giving us problems to begin with. So, and lastly, in addition to these items, we also took this opportunity to add a secured front entrance to the south side of the building. So very glad to be able to report that. So, uh, getting to price, the amended amount for the remaining scope of work in the science wing has come in at $11,186,513. Uh, adding that amount to the previously approved amount of $989,287 for the roofing and HVAC package gives us a combined total guaranteed maximum price of $12,175,800. Uh, all things considered, with the market being what it is, the tight schedule, and the unknowns of what we could run into with the structure, I think we should feel really good about the pricing that we're able to lock in. Uh, now, with that said, the cost of construction is higher than the $10 million uh, budget that we ask design firms to base their fee on during the selection process. So as a heads up, I do just want to let you know that next month, uh, I'll be bringing an item back before the board uh, to increase Schaefer Johnson Cox's, Cox Fry's fee uh, to account for the additional scope of work that they had to design to uh, as that scope increased. And lastly, before I present the recommendation, I would like to make the board aware that construction is set to begin next month and the project is uh, still on track to complete by the summer, uh, summer of next year uh, with plans to reoccupy for the fall school year of 2023. Which brings me to the recommendation. Uh, it is recommended that the board approve entering into an agreement with McCown Gordon in the amount of eleven million one eighty six five hundred thirteen thousand. That did I say that right? Eleven million one hundred eighty six thousand five hundred thirteen dollars <laughs> for guaranteed maximum price number two. Uh, Susan should be presenting this slide for me. <laughs> uh, this will bring the amount contracted with McCown Gordon for construction on the East High School Science Wing project to a total and final guaranteed maximum price of $12,175,800. Are there any questions? Yes, Luke, um, do we expect, have, since we've started the project and, we're, and we found this roof thing, uh, are we expecting any other additional things or do you or do we have a good feel for what the structure can and cannot do now? No, in the science wing, we've got a very good feel. I mean, we've evaluated that that thing um, every nook and cranny <laughs> from top to bottom. Yeah. But the um, drainage on the roof was a new thing, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, we, we kind of knew the roof was going to be an issue. Um, the, the conceptual budget, I don't know that we were planning on replacing the entire roof. Um, but there's just enough standing water on that roof. Um, you know, the way it's configured, there's the, the, the drainage and slope isn't always diverting water off to the drain lines to where it needs to go. And so as a result, we have a lot of standing water that adds to the load um, on the structure. So we just need to get that, wa that water off that roof. So, and, I, and in addition, it's a 20 year old, 20 plus year old roof. So. Uh, and so I'm, I'm assuming we had to go through the Wichita Historic Preservation Board on this, or did we not? Not on East High. Be okay. North High. East and, High is not on the on And the, the East, because we are not changing any structural or any, we're repairing, we're not changing any structural or any visual part of this historic building. We, the brick, the exterior brick will be, um, we'll be replacing some of that, tuck pointing, uh, correcting the mortar. It's going to look a lot more consistent. Um, if you've looked at the science wing recently, looking at the outside, it's pretty piecemeal. There's, you know, chunks of different colored brick in different places. And so it's just going to look a lot more consistent. It's going to look better in the end. And then finally, uh, the East High students that are coming in uh, this fall, uh, I'm assuming this is an area that they're not going to be able to access for a while. 
Correct. We've already uh, mobilized the, the fencing, and I just heard tonight that they started bringing in some equipment and materials uh, just this week. So, um, yeah, that's all. The areas that they won't be able to access, that's already fenced off, and, and the building will, will, of course, not be available for, for occupancy in any way. Well, I appreciate uh, the staff at East being so patient uh, with this project, and I definitely appreciate uh, the staff uh, that has done a really good job of keeping us informed on this uh, very expensive project, but very needed project. Um, Kathy. No, let's go ahead. Oh. I, ju I just, I can't ring in on my Yes, computer. Cheryl. Well, go ahead and have Kathy go. I just wanted to let you know I needed to Okay. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Luke. Um, you said that um, you're going to be coming back to us next month. Is that to recommend an additional monies for this project? Yes, that'll just be for the design fees. So construction costs, this is it. Uh -huh. um, McCown Gordon's contract, um, that's all inclusive. But the design fees, because uh, when we went through the selection process, it was based on a $10 million budget, right. construction budget. Mm -hmm. and so it was a 5.5% fee. Um, they base they base it off of the construction budget. And so now that it's closer to $12 million, it'll be 5.5% of the $12 million. Uh, so after all is services. said and done, how much time will have been invested in fixing the first problem, which went to the second problem? And how are we sure that we're not going to have a third, fourth, and fifth one down the road? Are you you're just speaking about the science wing? <laughs> well, you know, the science wing is attached to the math wing, and the math wing is attached to the, you know what I mean? And it's an old building. Yeah. Um, so East High is going to be, a, it'll always be something that we're going to have to be investigating and, and you know, I guess, Addressing things as they come. Okay. Uh, but the science wing, I can tell you, and and the whole building we have looked at closely. Um, so it's it's been a it's been a process for sure. Okay. Um, but you know, with that said, occasionally you're going to have to do a, a brick restoration or you know something like that. But um, you know, the structural concerns um, that that arose from the reports that we had done, those are 100 percent being addressed. Um, we are, we're extremely confident that we know everything uh, that needs to be done in that building. And we've even been uh, overly conservative, I'll say, with some of the things that our designers are requiring our contractors to do to make sure that it's just completely safe uh, to reoccupy. So when can the board have a tour when, the, when it's all done? Absolutely. And we're going to cut the yeah. ribbon? <laughs> yep. yes. Thank you for all your work. Yeah, thank you. Ernestine. Well, I think you answered the question because uh, I was concerned about how this was going to interfere with the kids coming to school in the very near future. Because you say that it's going to last, this construction is going to last how long? Uh, I want to say we designed to about 50 years um, life. No, no. <laughs> The construction <laughs> part of it, not what is going to, how long oh, the oh, building the construction. will last. Oh, oh, the construction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, sorry. Um. <laughs> how long are they going to have to? It's sort of, no, remember, no. E, uh, uh, <laughs> Kellogg, Kellogg has been going on for, what, 60 years now? The, the building. Of, so how long are we going to be building on East Yeah, it, no, it'll no. be a little less than a year. Um, okay. And in this period of time, we have a short, you have worked with the staff and the principal there so that we know that the kids can go to school there this fall and no. be okay and our workers can continue to do their thing. Oh yes, absolutely. The, we've got access all set up to where they'll just avoid that, that part of the building, but the rest of the building is completely fine. And I did see the signs that said that the main entrance was on the south and I looked at the main entrance and it's pretty sharp looking. It certainly is startling to not have to walk up the great big front steps off of Douglas to get into a main door. So it's really a wonderful exit, I mean, entrance into the main building. Thank you, that's all. Thank you, Diane. Thanks for coming to talk to us about this. So am I understanding this right, that the entire building is getting new windows, new fire sprinkler system, and reconfiguring all the interior finishes, or is that just the science just wing? Just the area? science wing, yes. Okay, Yes. thank you. Um, and then the guaranteed maximum price, uh, I'm assuming that no change orders are going to come back, or we found something else. We are. That's that's <laughs> correct. Uh, uh, we've. I we've, mean, I'm pretty familiar with construction. So. Yeah, I know McCown Gordon has set up their estimate to where 
um, it's conservative to where, and Mitch can vouch for this, to where they feel really good about their number, to where any unknowns we could run into, um, we should be covered. So I, I, I really would, I, I, I don't plan on coming back to you <laughs> for any cause. Now, with that said, I never say never. So can we time but, stamp this? <laughs> but that's the beauty of these contracts is that you really set it up in a way to where you're protected. It's that guaranteed maximum price, and you shouldn't have to come back and ask for more money. So I feel very confident I won't have to. <laughs> we'll cross sure. that bridge when we get there. <laughs> um, and and we are fairly confident that we're going to be done with the construction by the start of school year next year. Yeah, it's going to be tight, um, but we will get it done. And we're going to get creative with, uh, we've already talked about getting creative about moving in certain staff, certain parts of the, certain parts of that science wing as we can free them up. So rather than opening up, you know, making it all available all at once, once we get all the structural remedi remediation measures done, we can start, you know, we'll start going through with interior finishes and we can start to turn over certain classrooms a little bit sooner uh, as those finishes get done. So we'll be working with McCown Gordon. I know they're already starting to look at it now uh, to try to plan for that to where we can try to get them back into their classrooms, some of them a little bit earlier in the summer rather than everybody kind of right as that project finishes. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Cheryl? Yeah, I think you've answered my question, and it was about the uh, additional piece for uh, Schaefer Johnson Cox um, with the architects, because this $12 million doesn't include anything for them, correct? That's a, that's correct, a bit over yeah. and above. So we've got $12 million for the construction on the building, but we also have whatever their bill is going to be that you'll be bringing back to us for the final approval right, next right. month. Right, right. So you've already awarded a contract of $550,000 to them based on that $10 right. million dollar budget. Yeah. So it'll and just so be they'll that. add another couple of million dollars onto that uh, as far no. as the it'll, five it'll and a half percent. Yeah, it's a little over 100000 yeah. is what it'll add to their agreement. Yeah, and that'll be on top. So the total bill will be on top. Their bill will be on top of this $12 million. Yeah, a separate contract yeah. entirely. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Cheryl. Julie, do you have any questions about the East High Science Wing project? Um, I'm glad you pulled this item because I was interested in hearing a report, and I appreciate the report. It's a great project. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, I move that we take the recommended action on the East High School Science Wing project. I second it. Uh, moved by Stan, uh, seconded by Ernestine. All those in favor, oh, uh, raise your hand. Uh, Julie, how do you vote? I'm in favor. Thank you. Motion carries 7 0. Um, we'll go back to D1. Uh, Hazel, go ahead. Okay. Am I on? Yes. Oh, yes, you are. Guys, she can't hear Okay. Yes. No, you're not on. You're not on. Okay. okay. I'm on. The cost is um, $900,000. Well, first of all, my first question is what, it says adult ESOL students. What ages does that income um, cover? And the other question is the cost is $900,000 per school year, and then it says $1,800,000 in total. So in total of what, what, what is that totaling? And the other thing is when, we're paying a lot of money for this service. And how many students are we actually servicing in this program? And are we, do we have any guarantee for success for the students who are participating in the program? All excellent questions. Good evening, Vince Evans, uh, Assistant Superintendent of Student Support Services. And I'll be happy to help you. I might forget some along the way, so you're just going to have to remind me, and I'll make sure and get them. Um, Adult ESOL students is what this agenda item is for, and I should probably clarify first, and I'm going to take the blame on this one. That was a really crummy name for an agenda item. I would have just gone with adult services if I had to do that once again, because what we have is a program that serves adults, and it also has an ESOL component to it, so anybody who needs second language instruction gets some help. But this is... Um, this is not something that you have to be an ESOL student to receive. A native English speaker can go to this program. One of the questions he asked was about age. And 
What we have to rely on here is state statute. This isn't a program we do just for fun because we enjoy it. This is something that we're required to do. It's state statute 724348. And what it says is that anybody that's 19 years age or older, the school district doesn't have to serve them within one of our schools. So for example, if I'm an East High student, since we are, I'm sorry, live in the East High neighborhood since we were just talking about them, but I'm 40 years old, and I want to go back and go to school, I wouldn't go to East High. I would go to one of our adult programs. And that's what Orion provides for us through this program. Um, now, you asked some metric questions, and you asked about money, the funding as well, if I remember. So that in total question is a good one. What we have is a two-year agreement here. So 900000 for the first year, 900000 for the second year, and in total, 1.8 million dollars. So As that's what we're approving tonight. One point. We're not actually approving 900,000. We're approving a total of 1,800,000. Correct. We're asking okay. you to approve two years worth of funding, 900,000 dollars each year, 1.8 million in total. You, you asked about student population as well, and, and please let me know if I'm forgetting anything or leaving it out here. But there was. Uh, these numbers have been up and down throughout the pandemic. And Susan Willis can help me if I mess any of these up, but we've seen them go down to as far as around 200, up as high as 400 over the years, down during the pandemic, and now back on the rise. So I asked a, a former colleague of ours who currently runs Orion, Dr. Brad Pepper, where their enrollment stood at the end of this school year. And he said that they had 267 students enrolled at last count and that they had 18 graduates of the adult ed program this year. <laughs> okay. I, so are you saying, is this equivalent to GED? Is that what this program does? Is this a GED program or? No, no ma'am. This is an actual high school diploma which students can return to get if they so desire through that state statute. A GED would take a, I would say a, a lesser degree of work. This is going back and getting all of your actual high school courses and completing every one of them, just like a student would do at East High. And is the $900,000 a year, is that a flat fee, whether they have one or they have 200 students that they're servicing? It, it is a flat fee, and we do receive base state aid per student, just like we would for any other student in this district. So. You can, you can run the math and see what 267 times that would be, for example. On top of the, on top of the 900,000, is that? We, we recoup the state aid and then we okay. pay Orion okay, for gotcha. the services. Okay, and then the other thing was, is there a guarantee for any success? Or do we, what is this, I mean, do they guarantee for this money, do they guarantee success? Excellent question. They do not say we will graduate X number of students. They do not say that we will earn X number of credit hours. It, it is on us to decide whether we want to continue with that program or if it's something where we're not happy with the services being provided and would like to switch to someone else or try to work it in-house. Okay, so do we, is it imperative that we pass for two years tonight? Is that, I mean, we're, we're passing for the next two years, right? This year and next year. That, that is the ask for this evening, yes. Okay. I think that's all of my questions. Diane. You said this is similar to a regular high school completion. So how long does this usually take? Does it just depend on how many credits each individual student needs? Absolutely, and the pace that they choose to go. A lot of them tend to do most of their work online, but they also have the opportunity to come to the physical site so they can move as quickly or as slowly as they so desire. Okay, and so we do get state aid funding for the students. Is that calculated the same under the same finance formula for regular full-time students? I'm going to tag in Susan Willis so I do not mess up any of the details on this one. <laughs> Good evening, Susan Willis, Chief Financial Officer. So 
the, and this may go back to Hazel, your question as far as the two-year ask. Because this is an alternative program, and they are considered students just like any K-12 to student. So the funding is exactly the same. We receive base aid for these adults, and we also receive any associated weightings that they might drive. So their base enrollment that Orion is driving to our budget, we have those numbers for the past two years. So we know what they're going to drive from the 2020-21 enrollment. We also know what they're going to drive from their 21-22 enrollment. So that's why we want to go ahead to address at least what they're going to drive to our budget for those two years, and then if we choose to do something else or go back and reevaluate that entire program, we're going to do it in a year that we see what the enrollment's going to do. And we have a, an opportunity to have some discussion on what we expect, what we want, because we've, we've really not done that kind of in the midst of the pandemic. So that's, we, we kind of know what the funding is because it's really acting like a pass-through. What those adults are driving into the budget, we then are turning around and paying Orion for those services. In the alternative, we would have to hire and provide those services. And as some of these programs that are outsourced, they were done so because we could not do it as, a, as financially effectively as the outsourcing price. And I'm going to chime in just a, a little bit around the, the outcomes. I, I totally agree with you. I want to talk just a little bit about what's happening. We do have two programs that, that this um, program kind of sits with. And it one is at Chester Lewis, I believe. No, this is the yeah, Chester Lewis program. Is that right? We do have an in-house program at yes. Chester Lewis. And it's on services. Saturdays and in the evenings. And then one, the, la the second one is at Orion at Park Lane. Um, and that's during the day. Um, as far as program is concerned, one of the things we have talked about is looking at how do we take our partners, not just this one, but all of the partnerships that we have, and how do we begin to work with those individual um, partners to determine what success would look like so that they have goals and outcomes that they would be accountable to as we continue to spend money for services. Mm -hmm. I think that's not just important for Orion, but for any other uh, partners that we, we typically use. So we'll spend this year having further conversations about that and determining what those success measures could look like and then sharing that with and working with them. We won't do it to them, but we'll do it with them um, of what that could look like for us uh, with the types of students that they serve and some of the outcomes that we can expect from them. Are they currently sharing um, success or what they're, are they currently sharing anything with us of their success? I'm gonna turn here. I'm not sure exactly what they're sharing. What, what they share is a report on the quantity of credit hours that have been earned and on the, sorry, the quantity of credits. We got switched into college gear for a second there. The quantity of credits that have been earned and the number of students that have graduated. Okay, just so there is accountability. I mean, it just seems like a lot of money and for a few students. So I just wanna make sure we get our money's worth. Uh, agreed with you completely. And while the money that these students, the money that we recoup from the state is actually more than this quantity, it still needs to be very much on our mind with, is the most, this the most efficient use of our dollars? And are we doing best by these students so they're getting the best education possible? Okay, thank you. Um, just to follow up on Hazel's question, Susan, uh, do we receive and I'm not, I'm kind of following up on Vince's question. Is this a net loss or a net gain for us? We are slightly on to the good. On this, yes. on this particular program? Yes. And how many people are in this uh, adult education business? I mean, if we put this out on a bid in the future, do we, would we expect very many bids to come in for this kind of a program? That, that's a tough one to be sure on, Stan. I can tell you that Orion is what we would call a, a service center. 
Um, and there are seven of those in the state, but they are the one that is most local to us. Others might be willing to do it, but then it would be entirely virtual unless somebody wanted to make the long drive up to ESDAC like in Hutchinson, for example, as opposed to right down the street. And to that point, to educate adults virtually is not the same funding mechanism. Right. So we would probably be a little upside down, if not a lot upside down, if we were serving adults virtually, okay. as opposed to doing it in an alternative program. And, and ju just to kind of also add on the funding, if you if you take a look at the other item that you all um, uh, approved, which is the JDF uh, program, I believe that we do take a loss in that particular program. So while we may be on the good on the other, we're uh, on a loss on, on the other one. So it kind of balances oh, itself yeah. out, yes. Susan, have we ever uh, looked at what it would cost us taking staffing issues completely out of the equation and just assume that you could get staffing to do this if we brought it back in house, have we checked on whether it's still feasible to do uh, the outside vendor? So we've not looked at it recently, but obviously the, the, when we made the decision, we looked at it very carefully. Um, I think you'd have a couple challenges bringing it back in house. First of all, it is a it is a work at a, at a different pace. So having staff to be available um, for all sorts of different hours, because a lot of those adults are doing evening classes, um, when they can. So for us to hire and kind of make that work within our structure, we would that would be a little bit more of a challenge for us. Um, the difficulty we have just in staffing in general, paras and those type of things, to bring back in-house another program and then meet the staffing challenges related to that. Um, we looked at facilities. Initiative, facil yeah, facilities. Uh, we'd have to have a facility for it. So the... The, the rationale behind the why it's outsourced, uh, those are still valid, um, but we certainly can we'll revisit those numbers as we kind of look at those outcome-based decisions that, that we want to look at for this next year. Ernestine? Doesn't Orion um, do services for a lot of the surrounding school districts? And uh, so this isn't, is this a for-profit company? I uh, thought it was a, a like a, conglomerate of all the school districts put together not necessarily a conglomerate of the school districts put together we, we don't have a stake in them if you will however you are absolutely correct Ernestine they do serve not only Wichita but many of the suburbs as well and what are the su services that they do for them what kind of students do they do they mm -hmm. don't do adult education for them they do what uh, they do adult education for some of them, but they would also provide, especially for your smaller districts, a lot of their professional development. And don't they do uh, some special ed some places? Yes, In, you would find special education services provided by these types of agencies, especially in smaller districts. Okay, thank you. Stan? Cheryl. Uh, I want to go back to Hazel's question of is it possible for us to vote tonight for only one year instead of two? So the agreement that's drafted is for two years. So we would probably pull the whole thing and have to bring it back to you. Because you can't just change the contract. OK. It's a contract that they've presented yes. to us. And it was, it was built that way because we knew what, the, what, what funding they had driven for the past two years. So we, we measured that to make sure we would not be upside down. OK. And my second question then is, can we get data from them as a part of the requirement of the contract? And I know that that may mean adjusting the contract. It, it, I, I, they, they provide, as he said, they do provide it. But again, we need to work on language of what that looks like and what our expectations are. We just gather the data. You, you see where I'm saying? Instead of just gathering the data, we say, let's do some goal setting, right? Yeah. Let's. What are you able to provide us as an outcome for the services that we're asking you to do for us? It's, it's a different kind of a conversation than what we've had in the past. And we talked about that some, to, we've talked about that for uh, like the last some years and then we got distracted, but we're not distracted anymore. 
other things. So we are ready to have those conversations, not like I said before, not just with this, but with every other partnership that we have. We should not just take the data and say thank you. We should talk about what the goals are and how we're moving forward uh, with the outcomes that we would like to have happen. Right. Because they could be with adults. You've got adults that have got two credits that they have to get to graduate, and you've got adults that have got 20 credits that they need to graduate. That is and, correct. And so it's a little bit like state assessments. We'll have children at the f level one. We want to move them to level two and then to level three. But we do. But, but we need the data that says, here's where they came in, here's what they've done. Or set some goals to say, here are the credits that they've earned, and here are the, you know, or, or set goals of how many we would expect to have happen, or what's realistic for us according to the individualized plans that these folks come in and receive, if we even have individualized plans of a study for these students. So again, it's just a lot of things that we just kind of need to hone in on and, right. and, and build. Because I would hope that they would have individualized plans because that's the motivator for the student. Uh, you know, they know mm -hmm. I have this number of credits, I need 10 more or whatever it is, and I need it in these subjects. So that becomes their motivator to go in and get it in the right area so that they can graduate. Because the percentage between 260 and, to 18 graduates is pretty small. And that's what we need to talk about is what is it that you can produce so that we can determine whether or not this is the services that we want to have our students have, and if not, then are there others, or what should we do in order for this population of our students uh, that we would like to, how we would want to move forward. So it's just a lot of processing. Uh, Ernestine. Are these, are we paying for the past two years or we're just using the past two years as an estimate for the coming two years? We're using the past two years of enrollment and it's not an estimate because we know what those numbers are to determine the funding mechanism for the next two years of the contract because we know what those students actually will drive to our budget in 23 and 24. Does it foul us up at all if we put this on pause and let you come back to us and talk about a one-year contract as opposed to a two-year contract? We do have a state statute in place that says we have to have these services available. So we, we would have to be ready to go for the start of the school year. I, 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 if, if I can throw in just a word of advice, it's a tremendous amount of money. However, Ms. Willis made this calculation based upon down numbers during COVID years, and I feel strongly that the numbers are going to go up, and that that could work in our favor. If we reopen negotiations and take it back to the leader of Orion and say, we, we want to talk one year instead, I have no guarantee that I'm going to bring back a figure of $900,000 for the next round. I would like to move that we accept this as is, and then we can just vote yes or no. And I, I well, go ahead, Diane. I would just like to take a moment to, to talk about the pro-con list of approving it tonight versus delaying it one more board meeting. Um, because if we, if we delay it and try to go for a one-year contract, you're just saying that the price may go up. But the two-year contract, you're basically saying that you're locking us in at a price that's a fixed price that we can budget for. And if we have, if we have more students, our price is still locked in Correct. at what we're Correct. Negotiating with the contract. Right. He, he potentially is taking a little risk because if he has 400 students this year, he's got to do it on $900,000. And the, and the following year, if he has another 400 students, he again has to provide services on $900,000. So he is actually taking some risk as far as being able to meet those needs with the dollars that we're putting on the table. And you're stating, based on previous numbers, 
that we are in the black in our budget with this, with the yes. state funding formula in this contract. Based on the, based on the dollars, because again, we look, it's a look back for base state aid, right? Mm -hmm. We're looking back two years, and then next year we'll look back in a, two years, right? So it's the right, highest. It's the same, of, right, it's the same. Same way the right. enrollment goes. Exactly, same thing. I know exactly what his enrollment was in 2021. I know what his enrollment was in 21-22. So based on combining those years together, that's where we came up with the 900,000, and he agreed to it. So this, this is locking us in at a, at a better rate than if we were to go per student. For, for, current, for, for current year, assuming if he continues on his trend from post-pandemic gathering more students. Do you have odds of what we estimate the enrollment numbers? I know this is all, right. it's a guessing game, but I'm trying to figure out, do we vote on and prove it tonight or do we sure. wait? Based on his trends and, and the fact that he ended the year at 250 and that enrollment last year at the count date was 200, I'd assume he's continuing to drive enrollment and that he will at least be on the count date 250, if not between 250 and 300. That would be, that's my estimate, if you're asking me for an estimate tonight. Yes, I am. Okay. This also gives us a chance to set some goals set some outcomes, and we can bring those back so that we can know, at least know what we can expect or what he agrees that he can expect from him um, during the contract time. Can we, can we add those goals and expectations? If we approve this contract tonight, can we add those goals and expectations to that for those two years? Okay, I don't know contract language. Where's Where's Dan? I don't know. Dan, can we? You can't take a contract and then we we vote on it and then add. I mean, that's not how that works, right? No. I just want to make sure I'm not out of order. I'm not, I'm not used to the board so okay. Okay. How about you come up here so that everybody could hear? Thank you. Be, before you, he answers that question, I do have one more question. Yes, I got you on the list uh, right after Kathy. Okay. To ask another okay. question. Yes. All right. I have sat through enough of these that I ought to know the protocol by now, but um, I don't. So. <laughs> um, so where we're at right now, we have we have a contract that we have an agreement as to language with Orion, and. Um, the board can vote to approve it. If we want to add additional conditions or provisions to the contract, I mean, we're going to essentially have to reopen negotiations. So, um, Dan, could I? Yeah. With that being said, this is a, I honestly don't know how long standing this relationship is. I can tell you it predates my time in this district. We have a good relationship with Brad Pepper that runs Orion. And even under these terms, while it wouldn't be grounds for termination of the agreement, I would be happy to have an informal conversation with Brad and say, this is what we really want to see this year. And that might drive how our future decisions are made on this agreement. Uh, Kathy. Yeah. That would be great. I think what we would like to do, from what I'm hearing, is to approve it tonight with the provisions of, without reopening the contract of, hey, we'd like to see the progress of the students. We'd like to see how they're doing with this. It has nothing to do with money. And I like your way of thinking about going to him and saying, hey, you know, this is great. They'd like to see some accomplishments of, our, of the students that we're funding. I, I like how you put that, Ms. Bond, about how it is not about the money. If we were to have 400 students on count day and you were to estimate base state aid at $5,000, that would be $2 million that the district would recoup. But if they're not getting the credits, that's not right by our learners. That's right. And has any adults registered yet for this next school year? And if so, how many? I know that a lot of those 267 that they ended the year with will continue on, but I do not have an exact number for you at this time. Okay. And Susan, you're 
you're very accurate, as I've told you before, that I think you're very accurate, and we have the money for this. Yes, absolutely. We, we, we know we are very firm on, on, on the $1.8 million. And it's not going to hurt anywhere else no. in the budget. No. Okay, thank you. Hazel? Yes. Um, this, so thank you. in this contract, did you negotiate this with him, or is this something that they proposed, a contract that they proposed to us? So we've had a very, again, a, a very long-standing adult contract with Orion. I want to say at least 2010, if not earlier. So it's been a very long time. As far as the dollars, we have historically looked at his enrollment and what was being driven by his enrollment into our budget, because again, we're not providing those services, he is. We want him to be able to provide those services to those students. He'll need funds in order to do that. So we have historically based the funding pass through to Orion based on the enrollment that he is driving into the budget. So what I'm getting at is, are these numbers that we proposed to them or that they came to us he, with? I believe he proposed and originally, Vince, you might correct me, a continuation of last year's and we countered based on the enrollment with a slightly no, lower number for two years, and he agreed to that that's based my, on the enrollment. That's my recollection as well. Okay, thank you. D Diane, before we get to you, I, I, I'm going to attempt a, a motion. Uh, we already have a motion on the floor. It doesn't have a second yet, so I want to ask Ernestine if she would accept an amendment to it. She removed that we adopt the rec take the recommended action, and I would like to add as an addendum is if you agree to it that we direct staff to start the process of setting concrete goals and expectation for future contracts and for staff to enter informal discussion uh, on present day goals and expectations. Would you accept that as an addendum? Yeah. I second it. I second it then, Dan. Okay, well, I got three seconds, so that <laughs> sounds, pretty, sounds pretty good, but um, uh, actually, we did need a second because mine's just an addendum to yours. Okay. Yeah. Diane, we do uh, have a motion on the floor now. Thanks. I, I think, thank you both, Susan, and you guys explained that well. I think this is a, I think we should go ahead and move forward and approve this. So thank you. I, I agree with that, Diane. I think, number one, um, n we've basically put our cards on the table. So if we renegotiate, try to renegotiate the contract now, it's definitely, it will definitely end up being higher. So uh, I think with this amendum, addendum to uh, Ernestine's uh, motion, uh, we could start the wheels processing in uh, getting the goals out of this that we want. So the motion is uh, by Ernestine, mm -hmm. Amended by Stan and seconded by, I, th I think Hazel seconded it. She was the first one. All right. Patrick, did you have that clear? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor, raise your hand. And Julie, how do you vote? Yeah. Motion carries 7-0. And, and Hazel, that's perfect example of why we should bring these type of questions up, so thank you. Uh, the next item is, yes, that's what I'm saying, D7, Rainbows United. Hazel? All right. Again, it has to do with Rainbows, Unite, Rainbows United and how many students are we serving in this program for $200,000? All right, all, uh, once again. Vince Evans, Assistant Soup of Student Support Services, and I would be happy to provide you some more information on Rainbows. This is a, another organization that we sometimes outsource services through. Again, another long-standing relationship. Uh, as Ms. Stabler pointed out, the current contract calls for services up to 100 students, and this is the opposite end of the spectrum. This is for our youngest of youngest students, three and five-year-olds. It's typically students who don't need a full or half day of pre-K. They just need certain elements of their day covered. More intensive needs like physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, often provided 
in a home or daycare type setting. And uh, while we would definitely like to see that number up, back up to 100 in the future, it did dip down during the pandemic. And there were a range of students last year of approximately 40 at a low point, 75 at a high point. So what I did was when visiting with the outgoing and incoming CEO of Rainbows United, discussed this concern and we talked about how we can make sure that we are expanding our reach and they are going to be helping us out with some other areas where we have a need to get back up to 100 students for the upcoming school year. So again, we pay $200,000 whether we have one or 100. That, that is correct. So it's in our best interest for them Absolutely. to up the number. Yes, the I, I would like service. it to be. How do they reach the students that they're servicing? Because if you're talking about three to five year olds, a lot of those haven't even, aren't even in our radar yet. We get to assign them through what we call our ECHO team, which is our Early Childhood Outcomes team. Great place to go visit sometime. They are located over at Chester Lewis downstairs and they will test students that parents bring in from the community that they are wondering, does my child have a disability? Does my child need extra services? And they are the ones that assign rainbows as needed to help out with said needs. Okay, all right, that's all I have, thank you. Ernestine. Did this include children with autism? It certainly could be, yes. Do we have any other, uh, like we're not, Heart spring or anybody like that that we're dealing with with autism, or is this only rainbows that we're dealing with with the, the early childhood? We have worked with heart spring on and off in the past. We do not currently have any students that the district is paying for to be served through heart spring. Okay. All right. Thank you. Kathy. So you mentioned that there has to be a hundred students, and in the last two years we've not yet reached 100 students, correct? Is that what the contract states that? Just to clarify and make sure I understand what you said, 100 is the cap. So we could serve 50, we could serve 75, we could serve 100, but Rainbows is not going to serve 105. Does that make sense? Well, well what does the contract say? Does the contract say that it has to hit 100? No, it says Rainbows will serve up to, up to 100, 100 students. Okay, and the numbers were 45 and then 75? 75 was where we left the end of the school year. So and I would very I'm much sorry. like to see 25 more on top of that and get up to that 100. Mark. And how long have we been in contract with Rainbows? That, that far, far predates me. Okay, it predates. But us. I would be happy to dig back through no, the records. That's okay, you I trust you. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, Hazel, would you be willing to take the time to uh, go over to, um, regardless of how we vote tonight, uh, go over to Rainbow and uh, just get FYI for, uh, gather some information for the board. It's on my calendar. Okay, good. <laughs> um, I, I know Hazel will get to the bottom of, of, of whether or not this is, uh, what it takes to get up to 100. Because I think, um, you know, what, what we hear through the grapevine is they are also struggling with uh, staffing as well. So that may, and with the pandemic, uh, that may have been what affected it to fall below 100. So, uh, okay. Uh, I, any, I have one last question. Yes, go ahead, Hazel. Uh, as with the other contract, do we have any, are they reporting any kind of success in their program to us as well? Yes, they send us data each month and it includes what type of services they provided, the students that they've worked with, and we inherit everything they've done because they are also in charge of those IEPs while they are working with the students. So when those students become of kindergarten age, they turn over all of that information to our staff who are then the case managers. Oh, that's good. Okay, thank you. Any uh, motion on this? I move that we accept um, the Rainbow United contract of $200,000. Second. Uh, moved by Hazel, seconded by Cheryl. Ernestine? I'm just kind of uncomfortable that we don't have some involvement with some of the other agencies and get some more feedback from some of the other agencies. 
I realize that we're at the last minute, and so that's the sort of thing I would like to suggest that in the future years that we maybe look and see if there's some other agencies. Yes, that we can. Well, specifically, yes. Uh, Diane. Yeah, I th I think I'd like to clarify, Ernestine, what you're what you're saying. I I, I like the long term partnerships that we have established with people because um, they are in our community and everything. I think what I would look for more is more outcomes, more measurements. That's what I'd prefer to see. Yeah. And uh, I think Hazel would be willing to bring up that issue when she goes to visit with them, wouldn't you? Yes, I will. Good. Uh, we do have a motion on the floor to approve this item. Uh, all those in favor, raise your hand. Julie, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, motion carries 7 0. Uh, Patrick, next item, please. Next item policy. First review proposed revision to facilities and building program policies. Dr. Thompson. We have two policies here um, from our um, facilities, I'm on, of our facilities. Um, and you have the board policies before you in your appendices. And then this is our first read. Any uh, comments, questions that you have for us around the policy, um, Luke and I will attempt to answer those and get those corrected for bringing back for the second review, if need be. Um, Luke, I did have one quick question, and I apologize if I'm stealing this from somebody else, but did, did we, why did we uh, strike out the word architecture and just put design? Is that supposed to include architecture as well? Is that the nom normal day terminology? Yeah, so uh, Luke Newman, Director of Facilities. Uh, we struck that out because um, we, a lot of design services that we procure um, are not just architectural. Um, architectural is one of the, des the design services, but uh, we'll bring in mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, uh, structural engineers, uh, civil engineers, just depending on what the project is and what the needs are. So just want to generalize it a little more to where it applies to all uh, design uh, firms rather than just specifically just architectural. architecture. Okay, got yeah. it. Um, with that clarifying question, go ahead, Dr. Thompson. Yeah. There was, um, yeah, that, that was the question that I think she, we all, we, we were discussing, and so we've gotten that answer. Thank you, I think, is that right? Yes. Okay, okay I just wanted to make sure I, we answered what you needed to. Okay. And I think with that clarification, it's clear that that is just a uh, touch-up of that policy to make the wording uh, clear with, uh, to make it uh, workable for the staff. So, and this is a first re review. Is there any other questions or concerns about these two policies before they are on our agenda uh, next meeting? Okay, seeing none, we'll, wait, wait, wait. oh, I Diane, go ahead. I did have one on, Oh, policy 7080, it says uh, the functional use of district owned or adjacent publicly owned property. Can you clarify the adjacently publicly owned property? Yeah, are you talking about under the, the top portion where it? Yes. It, um, that was because we're doing more work um, in collaboration with the city. Um, Dr. Thompson and I spoke a little earlier today about a uh, recent example was the um, the road improvements outside of Northwest, uh, just north of Northwest. Uh, yeah, I said that right. Um, that that's you know city owned you know property, the the right of way. Uh, we helped fund part of those improvements because it benefited uh, our students and staff and the safety of our site. And so um, we're doing that a lot more where we collaborate with the city and there's a pot of funds that we kind of split and both decide on and agree on how to use those funds. And so sometimes it applies to district-owned property, but sometimes it's other publicly-owned property, if that makes sense. So are we sharing the costs with the city then? Yes. In is it instance. a 50-50 split, or yes. does that determine, is that 
vary yeah. at all. And we and we set it's a pre-established amount of money we both put put in at the beginning of every fiscal year. Okay. All right. Thank you, Luke. Uh, we will see this as a second reading at our uh, next meeting. Uh, Patrick, uh, next item, please. Next item under operations, second review, updating Board of Education boundaries. Uh, I do want to clarify that there is one sentence that uh, will uh, be removed from this uh, under the purpose, uh, and that sentence reads, uh, a preference for plan three was advised by staff and generally agreed to by the board. Uh, that line has been removed uh, for, for the public record. Uh, we have not, uh, hopefully we'll come to that conclusion yet tonight, but it was not, uh, it hasn't been, a preference is not um, agreed upon yet. Um, at this time, I'd also like to see if there's anyone from the public that is here to address the board about um, updating our Board of Education districts, voting districts. Seeing none, the discussion is now with the bench. Um, as you know, uh, this is the census-driven uh, uh, process, um, and this is a process that uh, the election commissioner's GIS uh, process uh, helped us with. Um, we had a workshop on it. It's been on the website um, since the 11th, and it is now time for the board to uh, make their recommendations on which map they prefer. Kathy, or was this for the last item? No, this okay, is this, right now. this one. Kathy, go ahead. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, we gave this to the public for two weeks to respond, and we've only gotten four responses. I don't think that that's fair to the community, and I, I would like to recommend and suggest that we give them a little bit more time to be able to evaluate the maps. Of the four that we did receive, um, they were basically on the same page, um, if, you, if you read those, and... Um, I, I just think that we need to give it a little bit more time, and Central County already knows that we're running a little bit late on this, so there's not going to be a penalty for that, and I, that's what I say. Perhaps I should make a motion. Is that what I do? Okay. I'd like to make a motion that we wait until the August 8th board meeting so that our community can have more dialogue than four. There's a lot more of you out there than four. Motion uh, fails from a lack of a second. Wait a Unless, and did I? Did I, I get in? Yeah, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. So We'll leave this motion open then, Kathy. Yeah, I, I just want to clarify something. Okay, so if we, if we tabled this, w typically, what is the number of people who typically respond to requests that we have online is this is four I know four just seems to me like ridiculous that th that's actually how I was gonna answer uh, Kathy's question was if there is a big problem with a map uh, you will hear from uh, hundreds of people and then I think, so I think that's actually a good sign that we've only heard from four. And I think it also, reading through those four comments, I think it's, there's two big points to be made. Number one, there was some confusion, and this gives us an opportunity to once again make it very clear that these maps do not affect school attendance areas. This is an independent, uh, this is voting districts. For state board, uh, for state board, for uh, local board of education uh, members, um, and then secondly, the other big point on this is there in today's environment, there is so many ways to reach a, a public official on an opinion that uh, I think you, if you talk to anyone with the city, if you talk to anyone with the county they also struggle with getting people to come to their meeting 
and address them on a certain issue because it's so easy to send just to send us an email. Um, the two comments I received directly was the fact that um, that uh, we they appreciated how straightforward our process was, and that our maps are drawn strictly from the numbers. And luckily, we had a small process to go through with only one district being out. And the only other thing we added on was that we wanted to attempt to try to put a uh, high school in each district. So in your opinion, if we extended it to more time, that it, would, it re wouldn't really make an effect, it wouldn't affect the way that we would Not a substantial this. effect, if that makes sense. Kathy? I'll withdraw my motion. Um, I would like to say something, if I might. Sure. Okay, I need clarification for the community as well as for the board to clarify and verify that there are no minority precincts that are being divided um, in these redistricting and these remapping things. That's, that's critical for me, and we really do need to be very careful that that is not happening. And I want, I want proof that that's not going to happen, and that could be another reason why I want to put this out until August the 8th, so uh, we have time to be able to look at that. I've not received any information about itemized precincts in the district. Um, before, I answer, before we try to answer that question, Diane, Okay, um, there, and I apologize, Dr. Thompson, could you explain what the triple A area is, is what that actually, what that phrase comes from? Okay, um, the triple A area is the area that sits where, I will just give some schools so that would make it easier for everyone. Um, you would think of Gordon Parks, Spate, um, you would look for uh, Buckner, um, Lee, Lee Overture, Lee Overture, Lee Overture um, the air, that area of schools is where we're talking about. Chet Lewis sits in that area as well. And so when you look at your maps, whether they're, whether it's the, any of them actually, where the lines are drawn, there is no line drawn in any area in that particular area. That's the first area. If you, and you can look for yourself, the maps are present, and if you guys can see, I mean, there it's just not a it's not a line there. If you go over into District Six, um, if you look at that area there, you're you're looking at schools such as, and I, I now I need to really get my glasses, but I'm I'm thinking like um, where the North Feeder Pattern. I won't name all the schools, but that feeder pattern there, um, that's where you have your. Um, Latino, Hispanic kind of community in, the, in that particular area. And if you look in that area, whether it's any map that you select one through five, there is no lines being drawn anywhere within that particular area. But what I'm also going to say, as we said to you before, the community is diverse, period. So we don't have any predominant race um, communities anymore. Um, they used to be, triple A used to be predominantly an African American community. You go in that community today, it is not as such. You go into cloud, you see very, di you know, it's diverse, but it's not predominantly African American on anymore. So even though you're talking within that triple A area, we still call it that, you're not going to see predominantly African American. So you're, even whether you draw those lines in there or not, it's not what you're going to see as well as, but District 6, what you probably will see is a lot of predominantly Hispanic families, and that community has stayed pretty, pretty consistent. But not to say that it's not others that live there, but that is predominantly. And again, there's no lines drawn in that particular area. OK, I want to thank you for that. I just wanted our community to understand that we're in compliance with the law, because that is law that we cannot separate and break up those communities that you say are not much anymore. So I just wanted to make sure of that. And, and the ironic part of this is, is that you're actually uh, trying to make sure that you're not splitting up neighborhoods that were more uh, historical congruent uh, neighborhoods 10 years ago. Uh, when you look at it today, and then when you look at it 10 years from now, when, and when the next census, uh, that problem will be even less 
it, you, you may not, hopefully, as we become more and more integrated, you won't even have to ask that question. Uh, Diane. Thank you. Um, as far as the maps go, right now the way uh, the maps, the way our district works is each Board of Education member has a district. We kind of look over those schools. We have relationships with the people in those schools. But really, from administration, we are encouraged to be board members over this entire district. And I, I appreciate that from staff, and that has been a very consistent message from staff since day one. Uh, the concern ends up being, in regards to the maps, is the question that's going to be um, on the... Uh, on the board table at the next board meeting is if we change the way we're elected to do district only elections. Because for example, if we select map three to be approved tonight, you have, for example, the elementary schools, Adams and Buckner, which are feeder schools for Coleman and Robinson, those are in two different districts for board of education members. And then those two schools are feeder patterns and East High, which is in another Board of Education district. So my concern ends up being is for parents to be able to have a voice in their Board of Education representative throughout their child's schooling from elementary through graduation. So the feeder patterns are, are important, but, but to be clear, this is these maps are only for the Board of Education members. This has nothing to do with school boundaries. It has nothing to do with where your child's going to school. Are they changing schools? It has nothing to do with this. This is strictly a Board of Education map. Correct. Driven by the need from the census. Correct. In state statute. And uh, the problem with the feeder process is that you will, no matter uh, what map you draw, uh, and I'm sure we have examples of it now, where a neighborhood of a feeder system could be in one person's uh, district, and then the physical building itself may be in another district. And so there's actually an advantage there in that if you wanted to go strictly talk to your representatives, you actually have two representatives to go talk to. But like you said, we've always emphasized and regardless, and, and we will do the whole uh, question, I wanted to put it on the ballot, we will use the whole month of August for that, not just one meeting. I wanna make that clear. You mentioned the next meeting. It's actually been a, the whole month of August. We'll talk about that issue. Okay. Um, Hazel. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, the, the four comments that we got online, they really were addressing their kids moving districts. So I just want to, yeah. I want you to, you know, establish that that is not the case. It's, we're not talking about that at all, I don't think. I think there's a misconception as to what these lines are doing. That's, that's very correct. This is not... Um, attempting to move anybody's school attendance boundaries. These are school board uh, voting district changes. Ernestine and then Cheryl. Yes, and then um, I got Ernestine, Cheryl, and then Julie. I just want, I just want to assure, I am on, all the time I've been on the board, I get phone calls and emails from people all over the city, all over the district, all over the Wichita School District, they contact me. And sometimes it really is phone calls, and sometimes it's because, um, say they're in Stan's district, and Stan's at work, and I'm at home, and so they call me. But any of us can be the conduit for any parent who has any issue for any person that wants to talk to us, whether they have a child in the schools or not, if you have an issue, you can contact any one of us. We will guide you to either the person in the district that needs to handle that particular issue, or we can have uh, someone call you, or we can even give you the school board member that's in your district if it's a, something uniquely to your particular district. 
someone from another district called me because they didn't like the crowd of cars that were lined up in front of their child's school, or actually it was a citizen that didn't like the crowd of cars lined up at the school, but it was some other district. And that's something that any one of us, we are representative, no matter how we're elected, we all care about all of the kids and we will always be able to handle and take any, we won't say, oh, sorry, that's not my problem. Thank you, Ernestine. Uh, Sh Cheryl? Yeah, just for the sake of moving us along, I would like to make a motion, please. Uh, I would like to move that we approve the MAP Plan 3, number 3. Um, okay, we now have a, a motion on the... Uh, Plan on the on the floor for Plan Three, and I think uh, Ernestine, your comments is exactly why our process is so straightforward and streamlined. In that, regardless of how these districts end up, there's only two things that are that are necessary because all Wichitans, everyone that's in our school district, will always have access to all seven of us. Um, so that is, that's going to happen regardless. So I appreciate you making that point. Uh, Julie, did you have a, a comment or did you want to make a motion or something? I, I was just going to make the same motion that Cheryl made. So okay. I had the opportunity to second it. Okay. We have a motion on the floor for plan, uh, plan number three. Uh, is there anyone that wants to make an argument, um, for one of the other maps. I know uh, only five, uh, plan five also includes a high school in each um, board district. Uh, so if anyone would like to make a argument that five is better than three, or if any of the other plans are better than three and five, and you want to abandon the high school in each uh, district, Go ahead, or, Hazel. I, I just want to know why three, why three? What is the argument for three? Cheryl, do you want to? Yeah. Um, district, district three really meets all of the goals that we wanted it to meet. So does five in the sense of a high school. I think there's a little bit less movement of the lines in three. It's minor, but but it is there. I think if I counted correctly, there were 12 changes in five and 10 in th and three. And that seems like a little, but we're really looking at little bits of changes. So it's not that I couldn't live with five. It, I just kind of based it on how many people were changing districts, and that's what the reason I suggested how three. How changes did you say for five? I'm trying to think. I need to have my notes. It it, it was it was no. larger than three. That was part of my uh, support for three as well. Was that there were fewer changes in three than there were in five. Fewer changes as far as um, student adjustment. I mean, t um, t school adjustments, adjustments between the. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. By two. Was, yeah. there, By was two. it only two? Right. Yeah. There, it wasn't much. That's yeah. what I said. But no. but there was less than three. So that's the reason I chose three. Ernestine? Well, I also looked at the geographical changes, and it just does not have very many geographical changes for people who are voting to end up voting in a different district. It had fewer. I really have left, quite frankly, comfortable with going to either with three or five. The reason that I would vote for three was because it just moved fewer people into some other voting district. In 10 years from now, we may have to move, depending on what the growth of Wichita, uh, the Wichita School District uh, does, it may be a lot of movement. Right. We got lucky this year, and we could make uh, fewer changes. Kathy? Thank you. I really did a lot of research, and I went deeper into these maps, and I am opting for map number five because of its continuity and its simplicity. I, it, to me, map five, and as you all said, you can go with either one, but map five seems to be a little bit more simpler, and there just seems to be a little bit more continuity in it in regards to just the districts themselves. Uh, 
Um, and, and I guess uh, this is a situation of eye, uh, beauty in the eye of the beholder because uh, I actually thought that the, it was more compact in map number three, especially when you get into areas of four and six, whereas four has to take a dive up into uh, north and District 6 has to take a dive into 6. I mean, uh, compact-wise, Map 3 was also what drew my uh, attention. Well, if you look at Map 3 on District 6, it takes a, a dive down south, and then District 3 takes a dive down south, cutting into District 4. And I think that in Map number 5, Without those, we're still in compliance with everything, and it's still very compact. Uh, that's what I was saying. Kathy, this is the area I'm talking about. The map yeah. that you are asking, that you're confirming is, I'm talking about this area here that dives into here, uh, whereas map three, Doesn't do that. it's straight across. It's almost a, a, a rectangle. And so, to me, map three was far more compact. But, huh. it, but map five meets the uh, requirements, too. Um, any other uh, comments on which map you prefer? If not, we've got a motion on the table to adopt uh, district map three. All those in favor? Uh, raise your hand. Julie, how do you vote? Uh, all those opposed? Did I mean, I guess I vote for map three. Oh. Yeah, I'm kind of the same way as in. I can go either way. It just doesn't matter at all to me because they both are so close. Okay, I'm gonna announce the vote and correct, and the board members correct me if I'm wrong here. I have uh, the motion passing five to two with Diane, Ernestine, Stan, Julie, and Cheryl voting for map three, and Kathy and Hazel voting no. Is that, Patrick, you're giving me a look like? I, I, I thought I heard Julie Say, I, I couldn't understand Julie's response over the she phone. She said yes. Okay. Yes, I, I heard yes. Is that, uh, uh, does the board mind if I confirm yeah. that with Julie? Well, she just did. <laughs> it, it is confirmed that she voted yes. Yeah, so uh, motion carries 5-2. Um, Patrick, next item, please. Next item under operations, resolution, Board of Education meetings calendar. Uh, Dr. Thompson? Of course, this is the time of the year where you, we have prepared, uh, staff has prepared a Board of Education meeting calendar for your review and consideration. Uh, are there any questions or concerns or, rec or changes you, anyone would like to make to the 22-23 board meeting calendar and resolution? Uh, of course, you, as, you, as everyone knows, uh, we do have to change this from time to time, but this will be our starting point. Kathy? Um, August the 3rd that we talked about is not on there? Yeah, we, this does not have workshops or um, special meetings on. This is strictly our regular meetings. Oh. Okay, I would uh, make a motion that we approve the 22-23 board meeting calendar and resolution. I'll second it. Moved by second. Okay, moved by Stan and seconded by Kathy. Uh, all those in favor, raise your hand. Julie, how do you vote? I vote yes. Motion carries 7-0. Does the board want another five, 10 minute break before the budget uh, report or do you wanna proceed through? Okay, we're gonna trudge on. March on. Uh, Patrick, next item, please. Next item, under finance, budget report. And it's a short one, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> All 
right, we are moving forward, taking another step towards um, getting our budget for the next, for the school term kind of finalized. We're getting closer and closer. And so as he's passing that out, I will introduce my colleague, Ms. Susan Willis, and we pro proceed through this presentation. It's not gonna be too terribly long, um, but we definitely want to follow all of the steps that are needed to and answer all the questions that you all may have. So without further ado, Susan Willis. Thank you. Uh, good evening, President Reese, or Superintendent Thompson, Vice President Hedrick remotely, and members of the board. Uh, tonight is our first look at the fiscal year 23 proposed budget. So uh, without further ado, we're going to hop right into it. Um, I think I need my presentation up on the monitor. Okay, there we go. Okay, so first we want to start tonight with a recap of budget technology, uh, terminology. So when people are looking at our budget, there's several ways to compare um, the numbers that we're going to publish in our budget. There is our original adopted budget from last year. There's the final adopted budget, which is the adjusted budget for enrollment changes. There's budgeted expenditures. There's actual expenditures. Um, so it all depends on, on what columns of numbers you're looking at and what do you want to know as far as are you looking budget to budget, are you looking actual to actual, budget to actual, what is your data points that you're analyzing. What I'm going to cover tonight is kind of a, a, a mixed bag of those pieces because sometimes we want to look budget to budget. Sometimes we're going to want to look budget to actual. So I'm going to cover various pieces and parts tonight. Um, what I don't address tonight, I will try to come back with on the 8th and provide some additional clarification on those points. Um, but I will tell you what I'm comparing when I'm comparing them so you kind of know where I'm at. Um, the other thing to remember as we're talking about the budgetary process is that this adoption process that the board goes through its goal is to adopt the legal maximum we can spend. And in that process, we, are, we estimate high, and we do that purposely for two reasons. First of all, the state wants us to estimate high. They want an idea from all districts across Kansas what the kind of maximum spend that they're going to have for fiscal year 23. So they would prefer us to be high, and then that comes down a bit, than for us to come in low and they have to figure out how to provide us more funds. So that's, that's our, the instruction they give to us and we follow that fairly closely. The other point on being able to estimate a little bit higher than we think we might actually come in at is because we can always spend less, but you cannot exceed the revenues we receive. There is a cap on our budget based on the revenues we receive. We, we estimate low so that if we do, for whatever reason, do get more revenues, we have some room in the budget for that, and we don't have to come back to the board to republish the budget, because that's obviously a time, and there's a cost to it, because we have to rerun that in the paper. Um, there's a timeline for that. So there's just a lot of requirements if, you, if your budget is established too tight. So you'll see that as we go through our estimating process. Okay, so let's start with that. This is the student FTE estimates, the base aid estimates. And really the, the first three columns uh, on your handout are not estimates, they're actuals. So you'll see the fiscal year 20 student FTE actual count for base state aid was 46,332. That's the number we used when we built the fiscal year 22 budget, two year look back. The fiscal year 21 actual student FTE count was 44,093. That is the first year we returned from the shutdown. So that was the year that we felt the impact of COVID on enrollment. I recall at the time I, I told the board, I hope we never have to use this year for enrollment purposes and we're going to have to use that number for enrollment purposes, for, for budgetary purposes. So that 44,000 is our new base aid number 
on which the fiscal year 23 budget is built. And that's a firm number. That, that's not an estimate. We know what that is. We also know what next year's the uh, potential budgetary number is, unless we have a, 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 an increase of enrollment. The fiscal year 22 student FT actual count was 43,451. We, we, KSD asks us to estimate what we think FTE will be for fiscal year 23. We put in 44,625. That's probably a little high. But again, they want kind of an, an idea. So we, we, we have, we just chose that. Really, it, it's, it doesn't f flow anywhere into the budget. It's just information for KSDE. And it, it's going to be a little bit high. The next set of estimates I'm giving you are the weightings. Unlike the base state aid, which is a two-year look back, we get funding on the weighted enrollment based on current year counts. So the first set of numbers I'm giving you is a summary of pre-K, low-high enrollment, at-risk, bilingual, CTE, and transportation. And I'm giving it to you in lump sum so you can see the variations for the past few years. The fiscal year 20 actual weightings in account was 26,477. In fiscal year 21, again, that's the year impacted by COVID, that dropped to 24,917. Fiscal year 22 dropped again. That drop was primarily related to the household income survey. We lost quite a bit of at-risk in that transition from families filling out the free and reduced lunch form to completing the household income survey. So when we're building for fiscal year 23, we needed to decide as we return to free and reduced lunch forms, what sort of impact we thought that might have. And so you can see I am coming back up from fiscal year 22, but I'm not going back to fiscal year 21. I think we're going to fall in the middle there somewhere. But again, that process of what our families are going to do in that free and reduced lunch form process, that's unknown to us at this point, and we are just now starting to see some of those enrollment numbers come in. So we should be able to tell you a little bit more as we go through um, the next two meetings. We'll have some data to bring back to you as far as how those numbers are going. But also remember, we don't stop enrolling. We're enrolling for you know the whole time during August and sometimes into September. To break that down just a little bit more so you can kind of see where those differences occurred, I'm giving you the detail um, of that total number of weightings. So the low high enrollment is a factor of the base aid. I don't have any control over that. That's, that number is actually pretty well set. The pre-K, we believe, is going to be very similar to fiscal year 22 based on early numbers. Um, uh, our executive director over early childhood said she might actually have some additional information for me by the end of this week, but I don't know that we're going to change our estimate. Um, we think we're pretty solid at 850. CTE, again, we were down a little bit last year, but I think we'll be back up a little bit. So we actually went in the same as what we budgeted for fiscal year 22 at 833.3. Transportation is really relatively stable. So we came in between 22 budget and 22 actual. At risk is where you can see I have come back up quite a bit from last year's actual. Based on the fact I do think we will drive a little bit more back um, on free and reduced lunch forms. And then bilingual, which has been fluctuating um, primarily down, um, we think we might come up just a little bit. Um, and if we're a little bit high here, we know we'll have to adjust some expenditure plans related to bilingual. And then CAMS is basically a, 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 a small program, so I don't worry too much about it. It's pretty stable at one, two, or three a year. So what does that mean overall for the general fund? So our general fund, and I am picking up special education and virtual, I did not provide the FTE breakdown because special education is a reimbursement based on the number of teachers we have. It's not necessarily the students. It's a teacher and para reimbursement. And then virtual is funded differently. So we just kind of lumped for the purposes of tonight into one line item for the general fund. I gave you last year's adopted original budget which was $402 million for the general fund. Our actual budget came in at $386 million and change. We are proposing a budget at $391, uh, almost $392 million. That reflects the base aid increase 
of $141 per student going to $48.47, but it also reflects the decrease of those base enrollment um, numbers of 2,238 FTE. And that's why you see a fairly significant drop, original budget to proposed budget, um, but a small increase from adopted to proposed. So I'll pause a minute to see if, there's, if that was clear. So far, so good? Okay. The supplemental general budget, also called the LOB, local option budget, is a percentage of the general fund. Therefore, when you look at last year's original adopted budget of $131.5 million, it was adjusted down to $127 million because, again, of the same reason we, lo we lost in the general fund, um, the enrollment did not pop back like we expected. Fiscal year 23, because the general fund is coming up a little bit, you also see um, a little bit of um, increase in the LOB. We are still maxing at 33%. Remember the expenditures that run through the supplemental general include transportation, which had a contractual increase of 2.5%. Utilities, which we'll have, particularly on the gas side, we'll have some increases. Property casualty insurance, and then your, uh, your business technology um, type expenditures. So there, are, there is quite a bit of pressure in this particular fund. Um, that's why we're still maxed at 33%. Some other key funds that we want to look at before I give you that kind of big picture code 99, um, which has a, is a snapshot of all the funds that we're proposing. Um, capital outlay expenditures, the original budget last year was almost $60 million. We had increased that, if you recall, to give ourselves quite a bit of flexibility as we were coming out of COVID um, when we had a number of projects that we were potentially going to address. Plus, remember, there's a lot of technology that runs through capital outlay. This year's proposed budget is quite a bit more, $101 million. That is a result of some of the transfers that we made into capital related to ESSER. So you're going to see a lot of ESSER type expenditures coming um, in the form of capital outlay projects, and this budget reflects those funds. Bond and interest is actually down about the same amount the capital's up, so those two kind of offset each other. But bond and interest is down because we paid off a series early last year. So that series, which would have was about $20 million, is not reflected in the 23 budget because we paid it off early, saved ourselves a little interest. Um, and then next, uh, on August 8th, I will bring back to the board kind of a schedule of bond payments left for the remainder of the bond period, because we haven't looked at that in a minute. Um, the extraordinary school program, which is commonly known as latch key, is quite a bit higher than traditionally it has been. Last year we budgeted $4.4 million. It's now almost seven. Um, they still have some grant money running through that they have not expended, and so we are budgeting it all to spend next year. Whether they get it all spent, it, it may full, flow over another year, but we wanted to give them the capacity to spend it if they can get it all spent. And then the federal funds, we're going to talk a little bit more here in another slide, but last year we budgeted $144.9 million. That was budgeting $100 million of ESSER. Again, we knew we weren't going to spend it, and we didn't spend quite that much. Um, we are again going in heavy on the ESSER projects um, and ESSER potential spending, knowing that if we don't spend it, we'll carry it forward to next year. The federal funds allow for that. So um, that's where we're sitting on kind of those big, big... Um, the larger dollar items in the budget. So the overall, because everyone's always interested, what's your total budget? And the overall total budget, net of transfers, because we have to move a lot of money from the general fund into all the other funds, but net of transfers, the original adopted budget was $976 million last year. We are proposing a $981 million budget this year, which is an, a budgetary increase of about $5 million. We shared with the board early on that we believed our funding from a budgetary perspective would be relatively flat because even though we have a base aid increase, we had a, that enrollment hit. And you can kind of see that reflected somewhat in this number. There's a whole lot of other moving parts, but that's generally why you're seeing a, 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 not a huge increase in budgetary authority, budget to budget. 
What I've also provided you in a separate handout tonight is the code 99. And I did that obviously because on the screen it's very small print. <laughs> Even printed out, it's very small print. Um, but a couple points I wanted to, to, to highlight related to this draft, and it is still a draft. We are, we've been through one review. We're going through the second review right now. We'll do a third review. So we want to make sure that, that all our numbers are sound before we're ready for notice of hearing. Um, the the at-risk budget is actually up quite a bit. Um, let me get my copy handy here. The actual last year was $103 million. We are budgeting $125 million. And I thought it worth um, bringing this one to your attention only because we were looking at the trend data related to how we defined our at-risk population. From a funding perspective, we receive funding for at-risk students based on free lunch. That's the, that's the mechanism. And of course, last year it was based on the household income survey in similar criteria. But as far as the students themselves, how are they classified as at-risk, there's a number of factors that, that that a student is considered at risk. Um, they're, not, they're not achieving um, grade level status. They've failed a course. Um, their attendance issues, there's, there's several um, criteria that, that define a student as at risk. And historically, we've been running um, at risk student populations between 60 and 70%, sometimes as high as 72. Um, we went to 78% at risk student identification. Um, and so we are going back through all of those core teachers that teach students, and we are split funding them in a higher percentage to at risk because our student base is a higher percentage at risk. And that is a pretty significant um, bump. I think if, if all the other data points you're hearing through various presentations, you can see that impact of COVID um, in that particular number. Um, it, was, it was actually quite shocking to me based on last year's splits to go up to 78% for this year. So, but that's why you're seeing that, that kind of large budgetary impact um, is because we want to capture the correct split for our at-risk um, at -risk expenditures. Um, the, the bilingual education fund, um, it was down a little bit this year from an actual perspective. So if you're looking, again, actuals to budget, you're going to go, well, it was at 14 and then at 10 and now it's up to 17. We actually um, we did some shuffling of ESOL expenditures into other funds that can also pay for that, including ESSER and a few things like that. So th th from, a, from an actual perspective, last year is a little bit of an anomaly. As we're budgeting the 17.3, that's a more traditional bilingual type of budget. Um, so pointed that out. Um, we talked about the capital outlay. We talked about latchkey. Um, food service, again, we're budgeting fairly high at $46 million. Primarily food costs continue to be a concern in this fund. Um, Professional development, um, it, again, typically uh, runs in, in the two to three million, so there's no, no, no major change there. Um, some, most of your summer school expenditures are running through ESSER, that's why that uh, line item is so small. Um, special education, again, pretty typical um, special education budget at $134 million. Um, will probably come in less than that because of we continue to struggle to hire paras. But again, we want to make sure we've got enough coverage in that fund. Um, got gifts and grants, special liability, capers. Again, is, a, is to, that's the pass through, but we have to budget it, so we've increased it because we of our wage package. And then you're, again, you've got your bond and interest. So that, in a, kind of the snapshot of the overall by fund legal max budget, brings us to after transfers that 981 million dollars I quoted to you. What does that do for the mill levy? So I, I believe I presented in June the, our proposed revenue neutral rate. Um, and I got a little bit nervous, so I bumped that up for the county just a little bit to give myself a little room to make sure I didn't, we, we hadn't received the forms yet. So we wanted to make sure we didn't, you can be under, you can't be over. 
So what I want to kind of tell you where we were up to fiscal year 22's actuals, what we reported to Cedric County, and then where I believe we're going to land based on our proposed budget. So you can kind of see the history, 18, 19, 19, 20, 20, 21. 21, 22 came in at 52.514 mills. That's 20 into the general fund, um, 15.783 into the LOB, 7.995, so almost eight in the capital outlay, um, 8.483 bond and interest. Um, you're a little bit in special liability for that total overall mill levy of 52.514. We sent to the county a decrease, um, but not, not a lot of decrease because we weren't exactly sure where we were going to land. So 20 mills to the general funds, what we sent into the county, 14.983 for the LOB, eight for capital outlay, and we talked a little bit about why that eight in that particular fund is so critical. Um, bond and interest at 8.483, that's the one. I didn't know where bond was going to land, so I left it for the revenue neutral rate purposes. And then I knew we were gonna wanna come up on special liability a little bit. So our revenue neutral rate, we could not, we cannot exceed, because that's what we sent to the county, of 52.483 mills. But we're going to, I believe, based on what I'm proposing tonight, we're gonna come in at 51.476, which will be a decrease of over a mil um, it, we're still not quite ne revenue neutral, but we're not too far from it. Um, and that's 20 mills on the general fund, which again, we have no control. That's statutory. Um, we were really pretty close on our estimate on the LOB. We came down just a little bit there. We s maintained our eight mills in capital outlay. We did bring down bond and interest, um, and we brought down that special liability estimate just a little bit too. So that's where we've kind of, that's where we're going to land, assuming the board is supportive of that work. And within that budgetary process, we did take care and adjust for the increases in transportation, insurance, utilities, all the fixed cost increases, and the net to wages and benefit costs. Um, probably would not have been able to do that without our federal funds. So uh, I'm just putting that out there that we did, and we shared with the board, and the board was supportive of that action. Um, that, that, and we have filed um, with the state our application for finalizing ESSER II and starting uh, the use of ESSER III. Um, it has not gone to the state board, though. I don't know if it's still hold up. I think it still might be held up in review. <laughs> so we're still kind of anxiously waiting that one. Um, so, and that particular um, application had um, Several of our mental health initiatives, again, technology, more summer school, new teacher support. The big one there was our maintenance of operations, which, again, we've talked about, um, new, uh, ex and the expansion of the para hours, as well as some of the retention pay for next school year. Um, additional ESSER allocation is also still available for special education, and that's, um, that's budgeted for SPED in the, in the federal funds. Um, if anyone is out looking at our, uh, when, when we publish the budget online and they're looking at those federal funds, the actual um, line item for ESSER 3 is actually greater than our ESSER 3 allocation, and that's because a number of agencies are also getting ARP, American Rescue Plan money, and it's flowing through to us as we're partnering with various groups on that. So every time we get one of those, we throw it into fund seven in that line item for ESSER three because that's the instruction we're given to do. So if you're out there looking as we're giving you the full draft, that fund seven ESSER three line item will be greater than our allocation and it's because other American Rescue Plan funds are coming our way beyond our own individual allocation. Um, we uh, do plan on providing the board a, a more in-depth ESSER presentation um, I think in September, maybe. I think that's the, the calendar. I think that's right. Um, might be October, but I, we're going to shoot for September. Um, in the meantime, though, we are continuing to update the ESSER webpage with our, um, our ESSER initiatives, um, some of the, um, the outcomes that we've received so far. And obviously, it's a requirement that we have our safety and operational plans updated uh, for changes. So as we are making changes related to any protocols, that all has to be updated and kept uh, on the website. Yes, so that should be coming here shortly. Um, and again, 
we did build fiscal year 23 budget using all of the ESSER allocation, knowing that we're not going to use all the ESSER allocation, but it gives us the maximum flexibility to, to maneuver with those funds. And then those funds will then carry over to next year's budget. So kind of the highlights of tonight, the enrollment assumptions in our fiscal year 23 budget um, are now based on post-COVID trends um, with increases to at-risk um, as the district returns to free and reduced meal status. That 3% increase in the base aid per student for us was offset by a 4.8% enrollment loss. Um, we are, again, using that full 33% on the LOB. The mill levy will decrease by over a mill. Um, and all of our federal relief funds are in the budget um, available for use if we need them. Um, but certainly we have our plans for not only fiscal year 23, but fiscal year 24 um, as far as ESSER is concerned. So what is coming for um, the next two meetings on August 8th? We're going to have some um, discussion related to the Senate, the sub for Senate for House Bill. Good grief, can't, it's getting a little late. The sub for House Bill 2567, those are the requirements related to the needs assessments and the state assessment questions that the board has to answer. So we're going to have those discussions on the 8th. And at that time, we will um, recommend to the board um, that we uh, provide a notice of our budget and revenue neutral rate hearing for August 22nd, and then August 22nd, we would hold the hearing um, and then adopt the budget, and then 10 days later, we'll certify to the county. And that is our budget plan, as we are sitting right now, with a few reviews still left to go, but I will stand for questions for tonight. Kathy? Thank you, Susan. You always make it so clear for me to understand, and I'm numbers is not it for me. I do have one question. Under the proposed budget on page four, slide eight, um, under extraordinary school program latchkey, um, is the grant money in that total? Yes, oh, it is. Okay. okay, and is all grant money in the totals of everything? It, it depends on the nature of the grant, okay. and it depends on the instructions we receive on where the state wants us to record particular funds. Most of the federal funds, well, I can't think of one that we haven't had to record this way. Well, yes, I can. Um, most of the federal funds you're going to find in Code 7, which is, the, that's what it's called. It's called federal funds. And we're required to record not only the revenues there, but the expenditures. Um, if it's not a federal fund, then we're typically asked to record it in fund or Code 35, which is gifts and grants. But in Latchkey's, it's, it, it, Latchkey, because it's kind of its in its own fund and it doesn't doesn't take general fund what you can support with general fund but anyway that's where we record those additional grants is directly into latchkey so that they can continue to spend it down and carry it forward for as long as that particular grant allows it's not federal specifically that has to be recorded on the form 240 which is um, how we draw down funds we have the funds as opposed to it being a reimbursement situation so are these funds or some of them designated for specific areas and that's why they're not put in number 35 is that what it I is think? specific to the program to of the program. latchkey right okay. yes great thank you hazel thank you for simplifying this for us <laughs> because it's like 10 million different branches. There's a, there's a lot. But this is just maybe a stupid question. Nope. Um, I just asked Cheryl, CT, it's on your slide number five. CTE is career tech ed. What is KAMS? Okay. What does that stand for? I'm going to have to look up the acronym because I, and maybe Gil might actually know what this one is because it's an academic program. But um, essentially, we have um, usually a student, sometimes two or sometimes three, that go to Fort Hayes State and we're having like a dual enrollment and they give us some funding for it. It's, it's an old program and at the end, one or two, maybe three a year. Okay, so I, just I, went, I don't know I what just, the acronym actually there's is. There's so many different acronyms I'm still trying yeah, to get acronyms. And everything. because it's that little money, I don't pay any attention to it other than yeah. it's one, two, or three. Okay. But if that's, you would like, I think Gil may have pulled it up. And I believe it's at Fort Hayes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Diane. Okay, I just want to clarify sure. a few things. So on slide three, page two, 
for full-time enrollment, the estimate you have increased, you have it higher than the 2021 enrollment. And it, to clarify, you're wanting to that's estimate high right. for the legal limit. So on if we are on the 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 44,625 is that what you're on? Yes. Okay. So that that particular estimate while it's might be interesting, it's not meaningful to the budgetary process because that's the that's what we're saying if if all things go and align and it, we have some of those students come back and we have a few more pre-K kids show up, we think we might be at 44,625. But that number, they don't hold us to that. So if an actual enrollment is 42,000, they're going to use the 42,000. That 44,000 in this case is just kind of a best high guess of where we might land on base aid enrollment. But it, the me, it, that number is never used for okay. any purpose, really. The more important estimates are actually the next slide, which are the weightings estimate. Those estimates I do use to build this year's budget. Okay, and those are, that's not per student, because you might have one student with multiple weightings. Yes, right, okay. it is so truly a pieces and parts of, a, it could be one student with a little bit of SPED and a little bit of ESOL. I mean, one student can be weighted with various weightings. I mean, that you're not just limited to just one, but it's one plus a little bit of whatever the weightings they are eligible to receive. Okay. And then my other question is the at risk going over to the the draft for purposes only. Yes. Um, the at risk K through twelve. I'm assuming that that our budgeted expenditures that is just a an estimate based on the students that we have had enrolled and their um, weightings and for the budgeted expenditures. Yes. Yes. And, and now. The, we'll, the, that fund receives the weighting, the at-risk weighting, but we also transfer above and beyond the weighting to, we'll, to fund that $125 million, because we don't receive $125 million in at-risk weighting. So right. it will have to be funded between the general fund and the supplemental general fund to re if we reach those level of expenditures. Okay. We probably won't be quite at $125 million, but we, again, given the fact that close to 80% of our kids are considered at-risk, and so some of those schools are going to have pretty high teacher allocations funded at, at, at risk. We wanted to make sure that fund had enough capacity to take that. Okay. All right. Thank you, Susan. I yes. appreciate it. Uh, Cheryl, any questions? Um, excellent report. And you did bring it down to the level where, you know, we can, we can see it and understand it. Um, I think we just want to reiterate that as you bring back the meeting, the, the budget at the next meeting, we will be proposing the, the amount that we will look at as our high for our budget. Right. The, 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 it is hopefully our intent, if we've done our job well so far, that you will see this very same code 99 again next week, which is the notice of hearing amount. But if we find a little something we've not keyed correctly, or we get some additional information on enrollment, we may tweak something for August 8th, but that's not our intent, because so far it looks pretty solid. I intend at this point to bring back the, uh, the same Code 99 um, for approval for the notice of hearing, because we think, we're, we think our estimates are pretty solid. Yeah, and where you're making some assumptions is on that free and reduced lunch piece. Yes. I am making an assumption on the fact that I believe we will have some return of who qualified for free lunch based on the fact that the families who might not have filled out the household income survey because there wasn't a reason to do so, or that filled it out without maybe the correct information and there was no reason to go back and amend it because there wasn't, there wasn't anything to be gained by that process that because there's a free lunch now at play, that if we're calling for information, we might get some, um, we might get that response related to a clarification on free and reduced lunch forms. And I assume that with enrollment, and I guess maybe this is for you, Alicia, we have put in into our enrollment packets up front that free and reduced lunch form. 
so that our parents can fill that out because there will be free breakfast. There will not be free lunches without filling out that form. And they also need to understand that it's just not about the lunches. It's also about your school fees and everything else. And sports and a whole lot of things we depend guess. on that form. So it is to, to the parents' advantage if they believe that they qualify. Fill it out anyway just to make sure that you do or you don't so that you can take advantage of uh, the, we work very closely with nutrition services and um, strategic communications, and we have been working on communication strategies all summer long. Parent links, posters, inserts into um, the summer meal program participants, um, a l really a lot of communication around the fact that those that this process is changing. Um, we had we brought in clerical staff early and train them on, because a lot of them hadn't ever been through meals, let alone going back to the old way of doing things. So um, we've, we've really tried to put our best foot forward on this transition, knowing that's difficult for families. Um, and I think those, the teams have, have, have really tried to, to get us in a good spot. Yeah, so with that, you feel comfortable with putting that $17 million in there, correct? Seventeen yes. million three hundred and seventy-five. That, 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 that's where I think we're going to, as far as our FTE estimate. Yes. Um, okay. Again, if it's if if it's a little less, we'll have to adjust right. some some spending down. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Cheryl. Julie, do you have any questions on the budget presentation? Uh, no, I don't have any questions, Dan. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Okay. Um, we look forward to uh, hearing from the public. Uh, there was no one tonight, but uh, if anyone is in the public hears this and wants to address us on August 8th and August 22nd, 22nd please feel free to either contact us uh, through email or come to our meeting and express your uh, uh, opinions on the budget. Uh, thank you, Susan. Thank you. Patrick, next item, please. Next item, under miscellaneous, superintendent's report. Because of the time, I have none. Thank you. Patrick, next item, please. Next item, board of education reports and requests. And I'll go, I'll go first because I, I want to um, uh, slightly different uh, format this, this week on uh, board requests and new business. Um, we are needing a workshop on this portion of our uh, agenda, and so I would like to move that we put a temporary hold on board request and new business, and that we hold a workshop on this particular section of the BOE agenda, and that we have the superintendent set up a workshop before or next board meeting. Uh, and just for board members' uh, calendars, we're looking at August 3rd. And that is a motion. Yes, uh, board uh, workshops are usually at noon, uh, but you'll once we confirm it, uh, you'll get that time for sure. I second it. Uh, moved by Stan and seconded by Hazel. All those in favor, raise your hand. Julie, how do you vote? Um, I vote yes, Stan. However, I, um, I won't be in attendance at the workshop which is held on the 3rd. I think I already told you that. Oh, sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, motion carries 6-0, uh, Patrick, with uh, Ernestine not here. Missing. Okay. Uh, skipping to uh, executive, uh, the next item, which would be executive session. Uh, I move the board recess into executive session, session for purpose of consulting with the board's attorney who will provide advice concerning the application of law as it applies to the district pursuant to the Kansas Open Meetings Act exemption as allowed under KSA 754319 and that the board return from executive session to this room at 1020. Second. Moved by Stan, seconded by Cheryl. All those in favor, raise your hand. Julie, how do you vote? Yes. Motion carries 6-0 with Ernestine missing. Um, we will uh, be back here at 1020.
from executive session, uh, no action taken or needed. Um, I would like to now call on uh, Hazel to make a board request uh, announcement. Yeah, I just would like to, uh, not long ago, we went on a visit to the service center and didn't realize what they, what their jobs were there and how much they contributed to our district. And I just want to put a shout out to the um, service center, especially the food service, because they worked all summer providing all of these meals to students every single day. And I think they just kind of slipped between the cracks and I just want to acknowledge them and thank them for the service that they give our kids in our district. I, and I think we would all second that motion for sure. We appreciate everyone's hard work this summer and uh, the people at the service center have done an extraordinary job, especially in food service, and we, we definitely appreciate them. Thank you for bringing that up, Hazel. Uh, Patrick, next item, please. Next item, adjournment. I second. Moved by Cheryl, seconded by Kathy to adjourn. All those in favor, raise your hand. Motion carries 5-0 with Diane, Stan, Kathy, Cheryl, and Hazel.